Blank check with Griffin and David. Blank check with Griffin and David. Don't know what to say or to expect. All you need to know is that the name of the show is Blank Check. In the future, cities will become deserts, roads will become battlefields, and the hope of mankind will appear as a podcast. There you go. Stranger. 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 Just one podcast can make a difference. Yeah, but I liked the, the longer one, the yeah. drawing it out. This film has four taglines and zero quotes on its IMDb page. Yeah. Because this movie has very little dialogue. Here's another tagline. When all that's left is one last chance. Play, pray that he's still out there podcasting. How about this as a tagline? Okay. Uh, Ruthless. Savage. Spectacular. I mean, that fucking rules. Yeah, it's pretty good. Every movie poster should just be one word ellipses, one word ellipses. I wish I could read this German one because it looks very intense. It's kind of crazy how every poster for this movie rules. Uh, yeah, that's true. Like there's the painted Australian one. That's the Mad Max 2 one. There's the sort of just like him on the road. That's the American Road Warrior one. Right. Mad Max 2, Der Vollstrecker. This Japanese one's pretty cool, too. That fucking rule. Look at that. Well, here's here's an idea. Maybe if every single piece of imagery in your movie is fucking awesome, it's almost impossible to make a bad poster for right, it. Right, right, Whether you're just compositing images or shooting something particularly for the poster or painting it, everything in this movie looks so goddamn cool. Hello, everybody. My name is Griffin you. Newman. Jesus. Who are you? I don't know who you are. I'm David Sims. Oh, well, this is Blank Check with Griffin and David. Woo. It's a podcast about filmographies, directors who have massive success early on in their career and are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. And sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they bounce, baby. Yes. And this is a mini series on the films of George Miller. It is called Mad Pod Fury Cast. Well done. Well done. Light applause. And today, oh, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Very nice sounding golf claps. Today, you think they still play golf in the Mad Max world? No question. Okay. No question. I mean, essentially, um, I, the the world has become one giant sand pit. Yeah, sure. Right. Big old sand trap. Yeah, sand trap. Mm -hmm. Is that the right term? Yes. I know a lot about golf. Mm -hmm. uh, today, we're talking about Mad Max Two, aka the Road Warrior. Hell fucking yeah, bro. Just one podcast can make a difference. Just one podcast can make a difference. Just one man can make a podcast. That's not true. You need two friends. You need two friends. Right. And, Unfair advantage. And sometimes you need Ben Hosley. That's right. Hey, it's me. <laughs> the word friend not being used there. <laughs> Pretty pointed. Uh, yeah, it's always kind of been a thing that I feel like even fans talk about. They're like, are you a friend? Yes. I'm a friend you, to the two friends. Correct. But you are also a Ben Hosley. I am a Ben a, Hosley. Which is a very specific honor. That's true. The and you're, It's you an honor that my parents that. bestowed upon me. And you're a poet laureate and a tiebreaker and a meat lover and a fart detective. Right. And I love a dusty boy. You love a dusty That was your big takeaway from this movie. Yeah. Right. You love a dusty boy. And and they rarely have they come dustier. Ooh, they are just covered in sand and grit, but in the best kind of way. Yes. They're dirty. I would even venture to say this much because I've been on the record saying I love wet stuff. Right? Mm. We all know this about saying, me. This is no wet. There's no. I, but all the water. sand, all that dry ass sand. I like sand too. Sure. So I, I like it dry well, on know, occasion. Well, like what in, is sand but dry water? Exactly. Ooh, that's true. You know, like yeah, it's like true. how the moon, you know, <laughs> yeah. has like the sea of tranquility. There's no water, but <laughs> yeah. it's like you know a dust sea. I I don't know. Uh, let the record show, David. Put moon in quotes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was getting I ready to I, put sea in quotes, and yeah. I just did it for moon. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've let the, the government moon landing wasn't tell fake, us. But the yeah, moon we, is yes. fake. Right. right. They <laughs> couldn't have faked it because the moon doesn't exist. Right. So, right. right. Exactly. I like the idea that you're the world's first anti-moon truther. No, uh, Marianne Cotillard's there with me. <laughs> there is no moon. There is no moon. It's just cheese hung from a tree. A wheel of cheese. Um, ben, I don't know if I'm exposing you here, but you in conversation, and if this is too hot, Rachel, get ready to cut this out. Okay? I'm not trying to out you here. Uh-oh. In private conversation. Yeah. 
you had told me at uh-huh. the end of 2019 that you were thinking of rebranding, that you felt like— Oh, that he was going to go off wet? He was going to get dry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had been thinking about it. It's a bit that's been going on for near four years. Me. You've been You're a little wet sick stuff. of you right. joking one time that you like a wet thing. Yeah. And then everyone, anytime anything has water in it, which is, by the way, a lot of stuff Most has things. water in it. Right. People are like, hey, hey, you excited? Hey, what? did you see this episode of this random show? You see this random movie? There's that like just a came lake out? in it. There's some wet <laughs> stuff. You should watch but it. But also, like, we're, we're in a post Aquaman world. We sort of hit the apex of yeah, wet Yeah, Aquaman movies. is True. kind of right. Right. Well, and, and what we, about Aquaman 2, though? Man? Well, that's the question. I mean, maybe that's the comeback, but I feel like, Ben, you and I w- were at a bar a couple weeks ago, yeah. and we had a long conversation about the dry subsection of the Nintendo character sphere. Yes. Dry Bowser, Dry Bones. Oh, Dry Bones is one of my favorite characters of all time. (laughs) That there's now all these dry varietals. Yes. Of so, Mario villains. So I think what it and comes down to. And you were like, I think to, I want to be a dry guy. Yeah, you were like, I think, I think I'm done with wet. I think I want to be a dry guy. Mm, I, it's like, mm. think about it. There was a wet level in Mario. Yes. I'm now, I've beaten the level. Yes. And I've now transitioned You're to in, like, the, the desert, desert level. Perfect timing. Mm. Yeah. I mean, we're talking. So like, you into yeah. like pyramids now? I Well, I've always been into pyramids. pyramids. I love a tomb. Big and dry. Big tomb. <laughs> he yeah. likes a big and dry. This is seismic. If he, we are actually embracing that Ben is now anti-wet pro dry. I'm not anti-wet. Okay. But I'm now more pro right, Because there's this Japanese movie, mm. Weathering With You, that's out this week as we record. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, it's set in a Tokyo where it's always raining. But now you're now you're out on that. <sighs> Damn it! Well, but that's yeah, Coruscant. I'm, I'm We've been there. It, it, not Coruscant, the plan Camino. I'm sorry, I'm a fucking. I've got moron. Dune to look forward <laughs> to, which is going to be a dry ass. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. that's true. But you know, in Dune, everyone's obsessed with water. You know, when he mm. cries in Dune, they're all like, <gasps> he uses his water to express his grief. They're all like, <gasps> it might be the ultimate moment. Venn diagram for Ben. Exactly. It's a dry, dry and movie wet. about yes. loving water, about right. the value of water. <laughs> they're coming together. Yeah. All right, great. Well, we figured it out. It just feels great. Like- All right, see you later. <laughs> All right, bye. Okay, thank you for coming. Mission accomplished. Now I know why you got him this bouquet of flowers because he's coming out as a dry guy. It all as makes sense guy. now. It just felt like I look. I'm not trying to force you out of the the dry closet. And it is all cactus, by the way. We should mention yeah, the cactus bouquet. bouquet. And it's kind of poking. Yeah, yeah, it's yes. dangerous. But I do appreciate it. Yeah, what a nightmare yeah. you must have been on the train carrying this. <laughs> Ben's hugging it like a prom queen and his ow, whole ooh, left ooh, side ooh, is bleeding. Uh, no, but but it felt like if we're going to be talking about the Mad Max movies for the next couple months, what better time to sort of embrace the, the dry guy 2020 persona? Yep. Dry guy 2020. Here to stay. All right. Like sh- Shy Guy, another Mario character. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Dry Guy. Or Dry Shy Guy. I don't, have they? I, I'm telling you, I mean, I was drunk, but we went on to the Nintendo Wiki, and there were like 20 different dry varietals. There's like a, a dry, like toad and a dry everything. Yeah. 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 What about them makes them dry? They're just skeleton versions oh. of the regular villain. So it's like, oh, this is like a skeleton paratrooper. This is a skeleton... Or skeleton this, this, is a, this is a dry bones. Oh, okay. That dude. But then there's... Oh, okay. Right, rather than calling him like Bone Bowser or Skeleton Bowser, his name is Dry Bowser, which fucking rules. <laughs> yeah, that is cool. It's cool. I don't know why it's cooler. Hey, you do not have to say that this is cool if no, you it's actually cool. don't think it's cool. No, I don't think it's cool. Right. I think it's cool to have learned that. Yes. <laughs> there you go. There, that's fair. That's fair. You're proud of I'm me. I'm saying that's cool. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> You're proud of me for having sure. me. Yeah. Uh, our guest today, of course. He's cool. He's cool. He's a cool guy. Cooler than dry Bowser. Wish I was dry, but unfortunately, <laughs> developing wet. quite a bit of moisture. <laughs> Already. <laughs> Uh, this this uh, this studio is kind of like a coffin. It's like some ancient Egyptian uh, mummification room mm-hmm. where we just uh, have all of the moisture leaked, sucked out of our body <laughs> over the course of recording long episodes. And and we're sitting here with the man who currently holds the record for longest main feed episodes. Still, if I'm not mistaken, I believe you're right. Silence of the Lambs came close. Great episode. Uh, Emily Vanderwerf put up a fight, but I believe you still have her beat by a minute or two. Is that right? I think so. I can double check this. I think it might be. I have an unfair advantage that that movie 
Heat is the longest movie, maybe. It's yes. quite long. <laughs> yes. And this is a short movie, but similarly dense in terms of things we could talk about. John Gabris back on the show from the High and Mighty podcast. Yeah. Thank you for having me, fam. I'm so excited to be here. I rarely reach out to someone to ask them to do their thing. No, but it was like perfect. We, <laughs> we were recording an episode. We were getting ready. We were like had just finished Demi, getting ready to start George Miller. And it's crazy how George Miller just like hits the ground running with two Mad Maxes. <laughs> yeah. And we hadn't found someone for this one yet. Yes. And I was and then like, you, were, it was, you fell into our It was perfect. Yeah. And it was like, this is such an important canonical action movie that I was like, we need to have a guest who's like representing the action movie sphere. Oh, a ton of tropes are created in this yeah. movie. A ton of action movie tropes are launched. Mm. On the back this of this This is one of those movie. movies yeah. that is like formative for the next 40 years of genre cinema. Uh, arguably kicked, like, chose the path that cinematic dystopia would choose. Like, yes. Yes. created, yeah. like, yes. becomes the almost Sporting cliche, goods stores are right. just available no matter right. what the, whether the country, <laughs> the world is flooded, yeah, the world is dry. Pads? It's yeah. oh, at least the used sporting goods store is always open. Well, right. it's one of those crazy things where, like, people talk about the first Mad Max being one of the most influential movies, right, mm. of the last 40 or 50 years. I suppose. But it's one of those things where it's like, oh, the elements within it are influential. This is the influential one. Well, but, but, but it's like it's in it's so weird because it's like Mad Max, if there were never any sequels, would sort of have like a velvet underground reputation as like, oh, it inspired they're, they're, these people to like do the things that would right then permeate the right. Mad Max one is like a, a hyper indie action right. movie, which is just was such an unusual idea. But then Mad Max inspires other people to take the elements of what he's done and then also inspires George Miller to be like, I think I can perfect this. Yeah, much like Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2 that, in the horror yes. yes, They're very yes, similar yes. things where it's like the first one's both made on a shoestring, surprise hits. Yeah. And then the, the second, second one is, to the director being like, no, give me like 10 times the budget and I can give you something that's even cooler. Right. And it's kind of a sequel, but it's like, kind I'm of not standalone. much different. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Like, same basic plot, same right. basic vibe. Just juice Just, it up a little yeah. bit. Exactly. Yeah. Bigger canvas. And sort of like focus it in a way, like strip it down right. to its basic but, elements and then take it to the extreme. And, but also both will weirdly acknowledge the first movie in right. like a brief prologue and then be like, we are a sequel, but it's also kind of a remake. Yeah. Yeah. And it's enjoy a lot of both. And uh, I'm so glad you said the Evil Dead 2 thing because it's really like opened it up to seeing it. It's like Road Warrior and Evil Dead 2 were like both looked at their first movie and be like, we now know what people dug about yeah, those yes, movies too. Right. Like Evil Dead, if people didn't find the irony or the fun in the first one, yeah. it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be a part of the second one. You right. know what I mean? Yes, and yeah, then yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. so the audience kind of helps steer. We're allowed like, to mix yeah, those tones. And, and yeah. so then the directors are like, fuck, now if I know you like that kind of tone, let, wait till you see my second. Wait, you know, Raimi's like, wait till you see another one. And then, uh, George Miller is like, oh, you guys like the violent part, the car chase parts? Well, uh, you're going to love this one. You're also dealing with like first films with largely like first time crew and cast. Yeah. Who going into the second movie are like, we've figured it out. We've all done this job one time and we've done it with each other and now we can hit the ground running. But here's the other thing. They also both have a third sequel that's kind of like really like grand. Right. And fans dig, but is definitely a harder one its to own deal sort with. Of like thing. Yeah. Army of Darkness and Thunderdome are also weirdly similar. And weirdly, and this is so per uh, specific to me, but. Though, I think it's just because of my age. Those were the two I was most familiar with. Yeah. Was Evil Dead 2 and mm -hmm. Thunderdome were the yeah. two that I... Because uh, they were like on cable Or Army of Darkness time. and Thunderdome. Oh, Army of... Yeah, sorry, yeah, rather. Yeah. Army of Darkness right. and Thunderdome. Thunderdome was on TNT, I think, yeah. every weekend that I was grounded. Any weekend I happened to be grounded, it felt like Thunderdome was on because I've seen that... With commercials a hundred times. Right. How often were you grounded? <laughs> Very often. <laughs> <laughs> but grounded, you were still allowed to watch TV. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, grounded, but no one's home because my sure. parents have to work weekends. So time. it's a very complicated form of grounding right. Right. where right. I'm like, okay, I can't go to a friend's house Technically. It was just your media education was every time you were grounded. <laughs> Little did I know I would eventually weaponize that to podcast <laughs> hundreds of dollars. Well, that's well, yeah. And then I, I said high and mighty, but also action boys, you have yeah. a podcast that is like specifically going over your favorite sort of action movies. Yeah, from, like from what we deem the classic action movie yeah. period. And we uh, uh a couple of months ago did Road Warrior. You did. So okay. yeah. I'm so Hell yeah. Okay, I'm so great. pumped Perfect. to rewatch it. Dude. Yeah. I, I, it's so fucking watchable. The other thing I I realized watching this is like Beyond Thunderdome, I don't think I've ever seen like all the way straight through, but I've seen so much of it on TV. Uh Fury Road, I've seen too many times already. Uh, the original Mad Max, I saw, like, they screened at midnight at IFC right when um, Fury Road was coming out. 
Okay. Road Warrior, I think I saw in high school and haven't seen since. I haven't. I hadn't seen this in uh, since I was a teenager. Yeah. I've only seen Mad Max once, and it was after I've seen everything. Yeah. I guess when I was a kid, I thought Road Warrior and Thunderdome were the two Mad Max. Right, right. And I thought it was Which weird that Road were. Warrior was Mad Max 2. I couldn't really figure out what that meant. Right. And when I finally watched the original Mad Max, I'm like, yeah. wow, this is nothing like... I see, like, it it's is shocking. It's very weird. Right. It's very yeah. fun to watch it last when you're like, I know what... Uh, this I know what everything's supposed to be, and then you watch that movie, and you're like, "Oh, this is not at all what I thought it was going to be." It's especially funny to watch it after Fury Road. Totally. Yes, like after yeah. all of it. <laughs> right, yeah. right, right. I think yeah. I might have actually seen it after. Did I well, say after or before? I saw it at IFC either right before, or right after Fury I don't, Road. Came I out. don't remember yeah. what you said. I don't but, remember what I said um, four seconds ago. I saw. I did see one and two when I was a teenager. Yeah. as a sort of just me being a movie nerd and being like, "Well, I should watch those." Yeah. And then I years later we were at trivia. And they played Mad Max. Yeah. And that was the first time I'd seen it in years. Oh, really? And I was like, yeah. I forgot this is like a cop drama, basically. Like, you know, like I remember being shocked by right. how lo fi it was. But And that it has like emotional dialogue scenes. Like all yeah, these he, things. There's like that, an like, interlude where he's right. with his kids, but you know, we we talked about that. But but it's that same sort of thing where like your cultural understanding of who Mad Max is, it's like even before you see these movies, it's so much a part of pop culture. Right. You're when coming you, in like right. unfortunately or fortunately pre-informed. Like so then yeah. when you're watching Mad Max and you're like, there are still diners and stuff? <laughs> right, right, right. 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 Like, he's like basically going to visit like Australia is having a bad crime year <laughs> right. is what's right. going on in Mad Max. And then Mad Max 2, there's like, there's no government. Right. There's no towns. <laughs> but I remember like when I saw the first Evil Dead. Mm. I was like, why doesn't he have the chainsaw? Like, why is it taking right. this long for him to make jokes? Right. You know, like, yeah. I didn't get... That movie is so fucked up. So That movie up. really messed me up when I was That's the thing. Like, Evil it's Death, the... Which we will do on this podcast. We will do. We will definitely do uh, at some point. Um, but, but the other thing that struck me watching this, having seen it for the first time since Fury Road, is that, like, as much as Road Warrior is to Mad Max what Evil Dead 2 is to Evil Dead 1... Fury Road is also Evil Dead 2 to Road Warriors Evil Dead 1. Right, right. It, it yes. ignores Thunderdome and it's like, oh, well, let's pop back to what we liked about right. Road Warrior. Oh, you like the part where the truck is driving and no, people right. are chasing no, it? It's, it's like, I bet you I could do 120 minutes of it's this. The Fury same Road <laughs> is basically just an updated version of this exact Which movie. Which is pretty yeah. crazy. Of, of yeah. one scene from this exact pretty movie, much. technically. Right. 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 right, it's like, can I make right. the whole thing that one scene? Can I deepen all the themes? Can Except I figure the, out a way to do more The villain is played by dialogue. the villain from MX1. Like, it gets so, it's so crazy. weird how he has reused bits and pieces yeah. of these movies his whole life. It's also crazy that he is an extremely respected art director uh, art house director yeah. in a way even though his first three movies were these insane car movies yeah and like he's, he's never really ne never really made, made a quote unquote movie. art movie he's right. made one studio drama but I think that he has always been highly respected by critics yeah. like there's just no, it's not like he was a Raimi was a schlock guy yeah you know what I mean? Like right. Miller, it was like, oh well, you know, he's from Australia, and, and even like like Cameron and Bigelow, you feel like there's a little bit of a well, bell curve like in terms right. of people getting them. Where it's like, right, you watch like Siskel and Ebert reviewing the first Terminator, and they're like, this is fucking garbage. Like they're not even giving it any consideration. Right, it's like trash. Years later, they're like, oh, I guess I recognize there's a filmmaker there, even if I don't like that movie. Right, right. But they're just like, there's nothing going on here. Whereas George Miller, it feels like. It's interesting. I mean, you read, like, the reviews from the first Mad Max when I, w I was looking up a bunch of shit last night because I watched – I rewatched uh, first Mad Max mm -hmm. you did and then yeah. did Road Warrior this morning and then was reading a bunch of stuff accompanying both. And the reviews in Australia for the first Mad Max are really bad. Well, because they were scandalized, I yes. think. It was just like, this is a scandalous film. It's a very conservative country. It right. especially was back then. Whereas it didn't make much of an impact No offense to some Australia. Of course, there are many non-conservative yeah. Australians. I'm sure some listen to this podcast. It didn't make much of an impact when it came out here, so I think its reputation was a little better because it was seen as more of a curio for the people who wanted to seek it out. Was it our cherry pop to Ozploitation? Like, was it like uh, the American... Like, 100%. So that yeah. I think that also gives it that juice where it's like, oh, this is, you know, like, remember when we were like, this is a Japanese horror movie. Yeah. Yes. Like when that yes. kind of came yeah. to America. Right. So whether it was very well sought after in Australia, yeah. the fact that it was, do you guys know that the Aussies are making some crazy ass car right. action movies or whatever? And so we get, we get that. And to us, that's the, I, like that's the iconic quote and, unquote because yeah, I don't yeah. think yes. like what are, like the cars that ate Paris like those are early exploitation things right. really made it to American no, no, anything and, except and like a midnight movie Weir doesn't hit until he becomes kind of respectable yeah you know right. um, 
Uh, oh, oh, the other example of it, I think that's like kind they of analogous. Have, what, the, the meat pie western, that's a type of Australian exploitation movie, which I, I just like the name the phrase. meat pie yeah. western. <laughs> like, I don't, okay. It's such a weird country. I yeah. don't want to generalize about Australia, but anytime I think about it, I go down a rabbit hole about it or anything. Such a strange place. You Americans talk, have been yeah. obsessed with Australia. Uh, I mean, I know since, that's different for you. Crocodile Dundee? Yeah. <laughs> why, wait, why would it be different for me? Why would it be different? Wait a second. John, what are you talking about? But like, are you accusing my co-host and friend of un-American behavior? What are you saying here? Do you think he's like a Rusky? <laughs> I believe he's, he's an expat. From from where? What what country trying to attack? He's doing a double salute? I don't know why. He's got one of those tall like uh, boom microphone hats <laughs> At the <laughs> fucking Westminster Guard wear or whatever their name is. Boom microphone. <laughs> if I was a boom operator, that's what I would do to be fun. Is wear that. <laughs> yeah, hey, guys, guys, check it out. Check it out. Yeah. Hey, I'm like that. Yeah, you see it? I'm not moving. <laughs> I would wear that hat and have someone else hold me. Um, no, I feel like there was a similar phenomenon with like Luc Besson, where yes. people were really excited yes, by La Femme Nikita. Right. And then in France, in France, they were like, they were like we're, uh, get, we're the trying trash. to get rid of this guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Um, and even, I mean, John Woo, I, I think, is more respected within his own lane. But it was the same thing where when I came here, people were like, what the fuck? And it gets that, it gets momentum coming to America because we're dying. And like, for like American uh, movie audiences, you're like, now I'm, I'm cultured. Here comes a movie from like a foreign movie. And it's just we make it the representation of that country. You right. know what I mean? Where we're like, yes. that's what I, th I think Luc Besson right. when I think of Paris. You yes. know and, what I mean? And it's and like this France. more than the first Mad Max, right? People watch and they're like, right, Australia is like some desert <laughs> that's just filled with criminals yeah. that shoot you and drive right. cars over you, right? Like, right. That's, that's what it is, right? Well, like Americans have always been like, Australia is like a place where there are animals that can kill you. Right. There right. are people that are gorgeous. It was Their a prison that turned cool. into a country. Yeah, it's, it's surfing. Very, it's hot. They eat shrimp. Yeah. yeah. Should we just get every stereotype? Put the it way, on right. the Barbie. Right. That's a knife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, the, and there was something like, it was magical to us. It was, so, uh, I right. feel like uh, Americans looked at Australia the way we looked at like when we learned about uh, martial arts when martial right. arts movies and we were like it's magic yeah like Asian people became magic in our movies for a while where they were like they're You're unstopped right. they could stop bullets Aussies can like talk to bears and right. like yes. walk right. on they're water weird <laughs> mystical you know outback folk well like right. within the 80s you have Crocodile Dundee yep. and Mad Max <laughs> and, and Young right? Einstein well, well yeah <laughs> But you have these two franchises that are both like, you know, different genres, but are both creating these insane archetypes of what an Australian what man is. What was the actor's name? And Young Einstein? Oh, he Yahoo was like, Serious. Yes. One of the greatest names of all time. Yeah, a good name. He was like the proto Jamie Kennedy. <laughs> yes. He does have a Jamie Kennedy. Look. Yahoo Serious walked so Jamie Kennedy can run. It's one of those. <laughs> so DJ Qualls can run. It's one of those things I always find fascinating where you look at like a Yahoo Serious or Jamie Kennedy and you're like, we, we really had the confidence that this guy was going to work in movies. <laughs> Like, I don't care how funny we found him on TV. We really thought we were going to watch 90 minutes of this guy carrying the emotional weight of the film. But Griffin, of a narrative film. Griffin, you're forgetting we all did get X'd. We did get X'd. I've been X'd. Oh, Have you actually been X'd? No, I, not yet. What a dream. The Knights of Puppy. Not you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but then the crazy thing is that you're saying that. And yep. that at the same time, George Miller made a no budget fucking action movie in Australia yeah. and just like in auditions unearthed Mel Gibson. I know. It's crazy. Like, Who's and, born in New York. That's yeah. true. That's I, like, it, the story with him is that his dad was so insane that he was like, we're moving to Australia. The yeah. real and crazy. The real story or the other story I've heard mm -hmm. is that his dad won Jeopardy. And I use that money true. to take them to move to Australia. Yes. Because my wife is from Westchester. Okay. And uh, he's actually fr was born Hutton in the town Gibson of- Gibson is, is Mel Gibson's yes, father. And yes. And uh, Mel was born in uh, Peekskill. Peekskill. Right. So That's so crazy. So uh, they have that pride of like, what? Yeah. Everyone thinks Mel Gibson's Australian, but he was actually born here in Peekskill. You know, like- Which right. has gone from being like a pride to being like, we want to make it very clear. <laughs> uh, you would be surprised. Oh, Peekskill, really? <laughs> Peekskill he, might uh, he agree is, with some of the things. I, I about, <laughs> he's still alive. He had 11 Mel children. Mel Gibson? Hutton Gibson. Okay. He yeah. is 101 years old. Jeez. Jesus. In my head, having- 
no, no idea what this man looks like. He like sits on like a throne of bones in like some Australian desert. I feel like he in looks my head, like he looks five years older than Mel Gibson. Sure, right. <laughs> when the- <laughs> he has a beard that makes Mel Gibson look sane. <laughs> when the Simpsons would show a photo of Matt Groening, do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, the, 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 the guy like, with the eye patch. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, what yeah. I imagine Hutton Gibson looked like. That's I mean that's incredible. Just 101 years old and still hating Jews with as much energy as ever. <laughs> He, if you think Mel Gibson's bad, anytime he's ever given an interview, it is incredible. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yes. It is, right. He's one of those guys who's like, you know how the Catholic Church kind of slightly chilled out in the 60s, the yeah. Vatican II, and he's like, I picked up. That's when I dumped their ass. <laughs> <I don't. laughs> that's when I was right. like, go screw. And when the Catholic liberal. Church got too liberal for yeah. me. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, it's like Mel Gibson becomes like this definitive Australian action star, but it's it's such random happenstance that George Miller found him that it became a career and he isn't actually even technically Australian. Well, it's funny because he went full sex symbol in America, but there he is so attractive despite what this movie does. I know. But but what these movies do. I mean, this is him, is peak him at hot as Max. I think he's his at his hottest in this one as Max in this one. Yeah, the first one he's a little soft. There's he's, something and, and a little delicate. Just, but this one they just yeah. know how to like oh, sort right. of grime exactly. him up just right. Yeah, he's they a little him, too baby face that, in the first one. He clearly cut his own hair haircut. Oh, yes. like, and it's right, so right. perfect. It's so cool. It's, and also we see Mel Gibson with a dog, which we know means like at least in most movies means the character has got humanity to them. Right, right, it's right. the first yeah. la- first layer of humanity with- given to Max or <laughs> Mel Gibson <laughs> yes. in reality. Yeah. And it's funny because uh, I just recently rewatched Lethal Weapon and Lethal Weapon Two, and it's it, he's got the dog that he loves, yes. and the yeah. dog is and it's very weird. It is classic eighties yeah. though. You're right. I mean, yeah, they're, they're like how ca- how crazy could he be? He right, loves well, his puppy. Yeah. There's like this fetishization of like the loner dude yes. who like. St- the stereotype, uh, the cliche st- is really hammered in uh, Lethal Weapon, and but it's gone on forever where it's like in Cobra, you come home and you cut your pizza, you put your gun in the fridge, you do this, <laughs> but there's a dog or a right. cat that demonstrates that like, oh, I'm going to root for this guy the whole yeah. time. Or there's a blonde with, uh, you know, visible breasts. But, but it speaks oh, to the efficiency like- <laughs> and economy of this movie that George Miller's just like, the opening, the first thing you see of this guy is him with a dog. Yes. I don't need to An show Australian you anything more. Herder. I need yeah. to show you find him the dog. Mm-hmm. I, the fact that they're close is just but shorthand. There's something about the one sleeve oh. down, one sleeve cut look too. I got, and I do you know, that. Uh, tell me, uh, there's tell me. Uh, the reason, uh, reasoning behind that is, because he breaks his arm in the first movie. Yeah. So right. if he I were, forgot it, that there's all those little hints yeah, about so the they, first so they, movie. So right. they connect it to that in that if, and that's why he has the leg brace too, because yes. he gets shot in the right. leg. Oh, so in the yeah. first movie, he gets yeah. his arm broke. Yes. So you would assume the EMT has cut the, yeah. it's just, it's a really fun, simple little like uh, setup callback situation. But it also explains that like, uh, the end of the first movie happened, and Mel Gibson uh, and the, and the Max was unable to find clothing or right. anything else. Right. Yeah. That's it. Right. He was just like, Guess but I'm if you remember this. the first movie, it didn't like end with like the oil's gone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but right. the fashion in this movie is uh. so great. The costume design, especially of like the White Clan, like the yeah. Hero Clan. Yeah, all the mesh. I really love it. And I also think that this is so 80s with that and that it's punk adjacent. Yes. It's oh, like, for oh, sure. It's got the like spikes and the like leather jackets a- and everyone stuff. Everyone in this movie could be in the decline of Western civilization. Yes. The bad, the bad guys have like four different like uh, aesthetics amongst yeah. them, which I really appreciate. And they're all sort of, each one of their aesthetics has sort of been co-opted or uh, created in the gay community. It feels yeah, like. hundred Because there's like right. the S&M look. Yeah. Then there's also like the biker cop look, which was sort of like the motorcycle policeman of the village yeah. people type situation. Yep. The T-1000 sort of uh, cue ball phallic helmet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then like uh, unseeing eyes, like aviators. And then there's like the golden boy type guy, like Wes's like sidekick, it, it which is, is like the effeminate like mm. uh, yes. style like it just they hit all of that oh and then uh, Lord Humongous uh, which was what uh, I would like you guys to call me for the remainder of, course, of this of course record. hello Lord <laughs> yeah. I'm the Humongous, yeah. the humongous. I might, that might actually be a good uh, uh, title for myself the way it's spelled too it's like hummus and humongous <laughs> it's put together. wrong humongous <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but I mean that's the vibe he continues from now on, right? I mean, totally. that's the F- Fury Road where everyone's it, called just, Toast the Knowing and Cheeto and all that shit. It's just kind of The amazing. names are, are so, so great. fun. It's so great. Where he's like, I don't know, it's the future. They're all idiots now. They don't read. <laughs> ding dong. Ding dong. Ding oh, dong. who's at the door? Creek. 
Hello? Hello? Where's Carol Baskin? Where's Carol Baskin? Uh, I don't know where Carol Baskin is. Where is she? Where's Carol Baskin? Who's asking? Me, Joe Exotic. Oh, you're from the Netflix thing that everyone's watching right now. The Tiger thing. Tiger King, Joe Exotic, the Tiger King. But I also got the alligators and the chimpanzees. So the name's a little reductive. I haven't watched it yet, but everyone's talking about you right now. Well, then you're not going to get a lot of the stuff I'm saying, but trust me, your audience will. Can't wait. I'm looking for Carol Baskin. Okay. I don't know where Carol Baskin is. Well, it's it's a long story, and it honestly, it would take hours to get into. If you're looking for answers, I suggest watching the entire Netflix miniseries. But the point here is, David, Carol Baskin had my big cats taken away. Okay. And they were structure in my life. They gave me exercise because I had to run away from them. They gave me a schedule I had to commit to because I had to feed them several times a day. I made videos about them, David. And now I'm rudderless. That was how you sort of organized everything. I get it. I get it. But, well, you know, there's other ways to organize your life. There's other, there's other things you can work there, on. The, wait, well, there are systems? Excuse me. Are you saying there are systems through which you can organize your life that do not involve illegally hoarding big cats? I do. There's a, there's an app called Noom. I'm a big fan of it. Noom? Personally. It's not. It's maybe not quite as high octane as owning tigers or whatever it is you do, but it is going to teach you the psychology behind the decisions you make and help you keep track of everything. Hey, like look, my psychology steps, is, is real simple. I don't need to figure anything out. I'm an open and shut case. Might it be helpful to be connected with like a personally assigned goal specialist and a community of other numers who can help you empower your changes? You know, like, of if course, you wanna, yes, like, maybe no, lose a little I, weight. I, I need someone like that in my life to hold me accountable because uh, my lion got taken away. I, I really, it's like one of those things where everyone's talking about it, but you don't know what it is. And you should watch. You I, I, trust, I think people are probably laughing really hard right now. Well, fair enough. I mean, all I can tell you is that Noom can help you achieve goals more than just weight loss. Okay. It can help you with better self care, feeling more confident in clothing, getting some more energy. Uh, it can help you make healthy choices more easily or understand your thought patterns better, give you a stronger sense of self-worth, maybe. it's. I mean, you're listing things, I'm killing it in all of those fields. Looking good, feeling well, confident, having energy. I'm killing it. Well, Unlike it, Carol it's just, Baskin. It's just 10 minutes out of your day, okay? It can help you log your food. It can keep track of your lifestyle, help you control some of your habits. And it does sound like you have a couple habits. I definitely got some habits, yeah. Okay, well, uh, thank you for the advice. I'll go pay full price for Noom. I guess that's what you're telling me to do, pay full price? No, no, no kind of special no, listen, offer? Listen to me, listen to me, okay? Noom is not, it's, for one, I just want to point out, it's not a diet. It's a healthy and easy to stick to way of life. Of it's course. It's based in psychology. It's going to teach you why you do the things you do and empower you with the tools you need to break bad habits and replace them with better ones. And you don't have to change it all in one day. Small steps make big progress. Sign up for your trial today at Noom, N-O-O-M dot com slash check. What do you have to lose? Visit Noom dot com slash check to start your trial today. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash check. I like the sound of free trial because I'm broke. Okay. I'll, I'll watch your show sometime. Now, if you'll excuse me, I got to go back to prison. Bye. This franchise is second only to Star Wars, and on certain days, I would consider... Wait, you just posi- said the fran- that to you, it's just the number two no, 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 franchise. No, no, oh, no, okay. what I'm about to say. Oh, okay. I think it's a phenomenal franchise. Sure. But I think it's second only to Star Wars, and maybe surpasses it in terms of how cool every fucking character looks. Like how like you can pluck some tiny background and character, every and it name. looks cool, and the names are great. Yeah, right. and you just go like, who is this person right, like right. who yeah. is she where and did it is she come from funny, what's her it's life like, yeah it's some fucking mechanic who lived right. i don't know in the town over there and right. we put a hockey mask on him <laughs> right and yeah. like, you <laughs> but, know, whatever. but that feeling of and he's like yeah oh it was a good time oh, yeah, right. <laughs> if you asked they would have an answer for everything but they have the confidence to not tell you you just can tell that they have the confidence of a backstory yeah in every performance and every design and every character name you know? i think i think we haven't seen that you don't see that again uh, in uh, cinema until, and this is a softer version of the, what you're saying, okay. but I think 
John Wick had that Agreed. feeling when you watch it. You're like, I feel like there's a series of books about Lance Reddick's yes. character. Yeah, right. like and like because I always 100%. I always use Star Wars and like Tales from the Cantina yeah. or the Bounty Hunters, like those books that fleshed out the five characters you see yes. once in the movie. Like I feel like you can have that about this is how the origin story of these freaks end up here in the post apocalyptic Australia. In, in uh, Mad uh, not Mad Max, John Wick has the added level of also the the bureaucracy. The way they world build the bureaucracy. Yes. The moment in the third one when uh, uh, Asa Kate Dillon first enters and throws down a bigger coin <laughs> and says, I'm the adjudicator, I probably laughed for three minutes straight. I lost my shit, and then they mentioned that, well, we'll have to bring this to the higher table right. or whatever. You're like, there's another fucking but, table. But that's <laughs> the, the, I mean, the best thing in yeah. Week 3 is like, no, we're international. There's right. Europeans we have to think about. But I feel like almost like any- I gotta rewatch all three of those. They're the best. But any like, I mean, anytime any franchise outside of, I feel like basically Mad Max, John Wick, and Star Wars tries to do that, it feels too forced. Yes, it feels like they're surely going. There are other franchises, they're, but, okay, but they're the ones I think about where I feel like they consistently work. And in other franchises, it sometimes feels to me like peacocking, where they're like mystery at the bar wearing something stupid, so you ask them a question. I get that, you know, right? right. right. But like, like it feels like too pointedly like we want to write a comic book it. about this. Okay. The, the consistency through which, throughout the films, throughout the universe, every element feels that. Oh, I would love to try to think of what other franchises come close. But it's the mystery. It's the it's fact the that they're able to sell the mystery, but make it seem enticing and like it's not just random. Yeah, like, it, uh, I think the Mad Max trilogy, the Star Wars trilogy, and the John Wick trilogy would have people, like modern people, asking, is this based on anything? Totally. Because it's just so rich and so right. specific that you'd be like, oh, there has to be a graphic novel that John Wick's right. based right. on, or right. Right. like there has to be something that Star Wars. You're is telling me someone just sat down and made all this up, right? right. Like yeah. the way that people, like you know, uh, uh, big fans of the Harry Potter books, or Lord of the Rings books, or the uh, Song of Ice and Fire books, will be like, oh, that character who's like in the background for two lines is actually like a big part of this other thing. That I mean, which is right. I mean, with Game of Thrones, I like right. the show a lot, but right, the books are have that quality, right. which I adore. Where he's like. Anyway, let me talk to you for five minutes about right. the meal this person's making. And Mad Max <laughs> and like, is yes. like, there's something to the fact that Mad Max. The Witcher Max, is like that. Yes. My favorite new show. Are you They're, watching The Witcher, Gabriel? Of course I've watched. <laughs> it's so fucking good. Of course. I've, first of all, uh, The Witcher is high fantasy featuring my uh, gay for a day number one, Henry Cavill. <laughs> he, his, there's, there was a recent, I have I have like one episode to go. There was a recent foreground shot of just his his arm. <laughs> Where it, it looks like, uh -huh. I don't know, a, a snake, I mean, a dragon <laughs> snake. I don't know. Like, it's so big. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, yeah and I, the movie, I mean, that means the show is like right over the plate for me. So yes. excited for it. And I just didn't love it. Wow. Oh, that's insane. Wow. You're, you're sick. You're a I know, sick boy. I know. And, and I'm kind of afterwards. bummed. And I was... We'll talk. At, this sure, we'll, have to be on this. After, but what the fuck is the timeline of that show? Okay, it's like it's like Dunkirk. <laughs> one's two weeks. One's like ten years. One's eighty years. I know. It's fucking insane. <laughs> it rules. Uh, can I ask? Uh, I know you guys are uh, watching The Witcher. Are any of you a uh, witch in the Watcher? Oh, I've witched the Watcher. Yeah. Who witches the Watchman? <laughs> I bought a, a full screen DVD of the Keanu Reeves thriller The Watcher, and I've been casting witch and Wiccan spells on it. I just did an <laughs> impression of the poster of the Watcher. Of course. He's Holding a He's garage. holding like a yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there, yeah, it is that thing though where like George Miller has also retained such control over Mad Max that right. there is so little. One of those rare like it is only mine. Yeah, and there's so little appendix media, and there, and there's no need to like delete some canon, right? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Where it's right. like, oh, don't, mm -hmm. ignore the Lord Humongous web right. series that came out five years ago or whatever. They did a couple like comics when Fury Road was coming out that I I think were pretty poorly received, but they, if I'm not mistaken, were like four one shots that gave you a little bit of runway into the movie, not like all the backstory, but here's like, well, what would have happened in the thirty minutes before, and that's like. From what I know, the only real additional stuff he's done. But like and the video game he, isn't like a canon well, thing. Sure, and video they games are fine, novels. but you're right yeah. that it never like stumbled into that Terminator problem. Yeah. Where there have been so many failed sequels that now anytime they do a sequel, they have to specify which sequels they are ignoring. Like, right. you know, where they're <laughs> like, this one is one, two, 
three is is implied. Like, you know, this one's just one and two. Because it's fascinating. And now Star Wars is even doing that. Yeah, it's Star like, Wars sort of is like, like ignore, ignore the that. last one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's fascinating that, like. We're like divorced. We're like the chi- children of divorced Ryan Johnson and J.J. Abrams, where it's like, I don't know what your mother told you when you were with her this weekend, but it's completely different here. Okay? <laughs> That's what episode nine is. Right. Eight and nine. Right. I don't care what you think. Finn and Poe are not gay. Right. I'm your dad now. <laughs> so nope, then the mom definitely is. Definitely like, doesn't matter. And Abrams comes in, he's like, he does matter in that he doesn't matter the emperor created him. I mean, it's, your job. it's that battle too of like half shit talking the other parent but then also trying to be lenient on other things to make the kid like you more than the other parent. Yes, yes. So it's like your dad's an asshole. That shit's not going to fly but also you're allowed to watch R-rated movies. Right. <laughs> like he's doing things in Rise of Skywalker that he thinks are going to make us feel better about yeah. the fact. Oh, I got chicks kissing in one scene. <laughs> like, all right, JJ, relax. It's integral. <laughs> An exclusively gay moment. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Finally. Uh, it, no, it is kind of crazy that there's like no other thing there, that all four movies are kind of standalone in a certain way. You know, they build yeah. on each other if you've watched all four. But yeah. the real connection is just George and, right. the, st- and the style. But the, the fact that like the fourth one is a new Mad Max who is younger than the guy was in the third one, and it doesn't care at all whether it's where it is in the timeline. If right. it's chronologically the last, if it's in the middle, why he's younger, if it's a new thing. Yeah, there's no like moment where he takes dice off the mirror of the truck right. and he's like, these are my dice from the first movie. You know, right. no, it's just a fucking straight... Fu- I, and w- name another franchise that takes, what, 20 years off? Yeah. <laughs> and then comes back with a fucking banger? I mean, you know, the, the, we'll, we'll talk about this more when we get to it, but the night that we figured out what this podcast was, was the night that David and I were going to see Fury Road. Yes. Of course, because you look at this guy's uh, uh, filmography, and it's, I mean, the story behind when he was coming out with Fury Road, there were, uh, us film nerds were like, do you know what other, like, I I remember saying to my wife, and just, I was like, I want to see your face when I tell you this guy's other movies. Yeah. (laughs) And when you just, like, list his other movies. No, it is the wildest. But but the thing that's crazy is, the version of that story that would make sense is David and I walk out of Fury Road and go, that's the podcast. We've been doing Star Wars for a year. The through line is a director who has that sort of success. Now that we've seen Fury Road, it makes sense. What's crazy is we had that idea 30 minutes before the movie started. We were sitting in the theater waiting to watch it. We did not know it was going to be that good. We did not realize that we were about to see one of the greatest examples of a blank check ever. Mm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and a movie that, in terms of what we've like discussed in our five years doing this show— by all accounts, should be a fucking disaster. Like, every time anyone's done something like that, spent 20 years trying to make one thing, go back to their old franchise, change that many elements, it's like a fucking train wreck. But there's something incredible to how much this and Fury Road are of a piece, despite being decades apart, at different budget levels, with radically different different technology. And different, I mean, even though Fury Road has a lot of the aesthetic of this, obviously it also has this whole... You know, its whole updated angle of like it's about female liberation right. and a, Charlie's Theron with a robot arm and overcoming the patriarchy, which this does not have, obviously. No, I mean, so he, Mad Max comes out, costs $400,000, and ends up making $100 million worldwide. <laughs> it is a massive worldwide success almost everywhere except for the United States, where it does not do well. And the studios got really scared. I'm going to just call bullshit on the $100 million thing. It's made up. That's it's the stat to, that they no, like to share. It's made up. It's made up. That's, that's, that's like, an insane that's, amount of money to not to miss the American market. Yeah, they, they, to make that much money without the American market or to be that successful You can elsewhere. call bullshit, but that's the stat that they repeat. Yeah. I'm going to call bullshit legend. on you, calling bullshit on them. Thank God. It's, yeah. it's, it's a stat where they're taking like every single home rental, every merch sure. sale. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a made up stat. But, yeah. Okay, but let's it, say it did well, but it was not. Inarguably, it was. One of the most profitable movies of all time. It's sort of like when I say, when people ask me about High and Mighty, and I'm like, oh yeah, three million downloads. <laughs> and they're like, what? And I'm like, oh, well, it's 280 episodes, but <laughs> let's not get into the details. Right. I was going to tell you three million downloads. And <laughs> 10 people have re-listened to every episode right. 20 times. Yeah, exactly. It's mostly a core element of freaks somewhere right. around America. Fuck right. boys. Right. Uh, number one, fuck boys. But it but was this insanely profitable movie. Yes. Uh, that doesn't do well in the States. They redub the film with all American accents because they think... The, Which is in a film with so little baffling. dialogue. Well, it has more than this one. It's it has so more baffling. than this, yeah. but it still is not a to very dialogue redub heavy Redub an English language movie. Know, just because you're, like, <laughs> you're like, oh, the accents are going to throw them off. I mean, <laughs> Insane. 
And they have that as an option on the Blu-ray, and I talked oh, really? it off a little bit. And it, it's astounding how bad it is because it is one of those things I, where it, like it's not astounding how bad it is. It sounds bad. Well, but I'll tell you, no, <laughs> sure, it's even worse when you right, do it. Right. Yeah. What is particularly weird about it is when you're watching a bad dub of a movie. It is usually like the way people like parody like bad dubs of martial arts films. Where that it's delay like, or whatever, yeah. right? The energy doesn't match, but it's also like the mouth is so out of sync with it. And then this, it's like they're saying the exact same words, but they're just coming from a disembodied voice that is a bad performance. Right? There's yes. something I mean, to the it's fact a, that it's the such lips are matching. Right, right. Right, right. So right. that's one of the things that you know sort of sabotages the movie. Doesn't do crazy well here, but like within the industry, people go like, "Oh, look at what this guy made out of nothing." So it becomes a calling card film, and he gets offered like fucking everything. And he gets offered first blood. He gets offered like all right. these big 80s studio action. It's films. kind of the John Woo thing. Right. Where they're like, oh, well, you, yeah, let's hook you up with the Sylvester Stallones. Yeah. Who, who do you want to work with? All the right. movie stars yeah. want to work with. Because Woo's first American movie is, is, is Hard Target. It's Hard it? Target with right. Van Damme. Yeah. So it's that kind of thing of like, you know, any big star is going to go like, this is a guy I should get in my corner, any big action star. He comes to LA, he takes all the meetings and goes, you know what? No, I'm going to fucking go back to Australia, double down and make the like four times as big Mad Max sequel. Yes, right. Does that and then that becomes huge in the States. But right. as, a, as a creative, you can imagine George Miller watching uh, Mad Max, watching its success and like, uh, you know, having to see it in theaters, having conversations yeah. about it and just the whole time going, fuck, let me get another swing right. at this. I, right. I, I, oh, man, now ooh, if I had money, we would do this. St- oh, man, I wish we could do this. I, oh, fuck it. The, the fucked up bad guys is the most favorite part of Mad Max. Like, what if right. I extrapolate that out? And like you could just see it. And then he's like, forget it. Right. I, let me go back to Australia. <laughs> let me wait. Don't just stay right there. Right. Let me come back with a, a movie I think you're going to really like. But it's it's a ballsy move because if this had fucked up, then – all those Hollywood offers would have been rescinded. Right, right. You know, I mean, he's always That's probably true, yeah. conducted right. his career with so much, like, integrity and gone against the grain of how anyone else would, like, go about making a career at this budget level. Right. And it's always sort of benefited him where he's just, like, consistently played by his own rules. A big thing that helped him is that he was with, like, Roadshow Pictures, which later becomes Village Roadshow, which becomes one of, like, the biggest yes. film financing companies and later does, like, The Matrix and yep. a ton of things yep. at Warner Brothers. But the fact that he was a local boy, that he was with them from the beginning, that he had this good relationship, meant that he always had, like, good funding. He mm-hmm. sets up the Kennedy Miller company from the get-go. Yep. He has a strong crew he works with. He's built somewhat of a little industry around himself with all of his, like, key team. Mm-hmm. Um, but but he just makes this crazy big bet on himself. And in the same way that you watch, like, Fury Road, sure. and, and you go, oh, this is probably what Road Warrior looked like in his head, and he couldn't until this point mm. execute it. You watch this. If this is what Mad Max looked like in his head. Yeah, and, and it doesn't feel small to you. Like, right. what's crazy is, even though the bu- budget is, like, minuscule compared to Fury yeah. Road and the difference in technology and the scale, I watch this movie, and I'm like, it still feels so fucking big. Like, you watch this, and Those you're like, wide this, horizons, this baby. feels like the biggest movie that ever. anamorphic photography. Uh, but so much of it this, out. just that, the way fucking Road Warrior uses the sky yes. is insane because you're just like, oh, right, I never see movies where there are no man-made structures anywhere on the horizon. Yes! Oh, and I didn't is, even put that together. There's That's just part of like it. one little fucking, you know, water tower or there's like a little crane yeah. or whatever. But a sea world, of sand, if you will. It just feels endless. Like you just, Back. every <laughs> shot... Is like this. <laughs> He's just been uh, googling that phrase for like forty minutes. He's like, "Sea of Sand." Sea of Sand. Sea of Sand. But like, almost every shot in this movie is just this insane vanishing horizon of just like uh, yellow and blue. Also, upon watching it this time around, I kept jumping back for little like. He does a great job of shooting these five second sequences that are small things like the dude's hand coming back in or like, you know, these minor little looking things that are you're like, oh, this dude has such an eye that, you know, he's like give him millions of dollars and you could still know he's going to shrink it down to this cool ass it's five second just like. Oh, when uh, when Max crawls, it's got to look like the choices he makes. You're like, oh, and that's Fury Road was like the best movie of the last several years. Yeah. And it was so long after all the Mad Max movies that right. you were kind of like, yeah, I remember liking the Mad Max movies. This is cool. It's you true. Watch it. yeah. Where you're like, yeah, do we need know one of those? Those are fine, right? <laughs> right. I remember when it was announced, I was like, why is he doing that? Why, no. why would you do another Mad Max? It, right. Uh, it, it felt desperate in a weird way. Yeah. Yeah. And then the trailer, well, we'll talk about Fury later. Yeah. Anyway, I also want to note that he was trying to make a rock and roll movie called oh, Roxanne, right. yes. which- 
you know, never happened, right. but would love to know what that was. Right. I forgot so that like was the step in between. When he turns down all the when he turns down all the LA jobs, he works on He comes on back Roxanne. and he's like, I'm making Roxanne. Yeah. It's a rock and roll movie. Right. And then when he couldn't get that together, then he when said, he couldn't Let's get go Steve back Martin to, to sign on. Yes. <laughs> um and he brings aboard the guy who wrote the novelization of Mad Max, this guy, um, Terry Hayes, mm-hmm. who becomes a collaborator for him to write the script. And Dean Semler, who becomes like a really big part of it. Because the first film is well shot, uh, but oh, very oh, yeah, scrappy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then this film just like takes it to the next level. Dean Semler, who's like less than a decade away from winning the Oscar for Dances with Wolves, becomes like this very prestige Hollywood cinematographer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, she also shot um, Apocalypto, speaking of Mel Gibson. Yes. Um, and they went out to New South Wales, to mm-hmm. the sort of, you know, blasted deserts of Australia, to a place called Broken Hill. Yeah. Which sounds, you know, like a great place. Apropos. <laughs> exactly. The, the thing I feel they, like I've know. always heard about Miller and his reputation is that, like, um, his movies, he always squeezes, squeezes maximum value out of the budget he's given. Even when his films are expensive, he somehow makes every movie look four times more expensive than it actually is. Mm. And the main thing that he, like, bathes in is time. That's, like, the main thing he wants is the time to do everything correctly. And I think that comes across in what you were saying, John, about, like, all those little shots where it's just the kind of stuff that would often be relegated to a B unit. Right. Or you're just like, let's just do it again from a different camera setup. But he understands, like, the energy with which you crawl in this one setup has to be different than how you're crawling from other angles. Because in this shot— Yeah, and he feels like he knows. He's like, the tone I want when your hand is right. coming back into the car is, like, you're destroyed, you're defeat, you're slinking back to your whatever. When like, it becomes maximalist, when the performances sort of become, like, kabuki theater. There's a story I kept on thinking about watching this movie that um, when Peter Bogdanovich was doing Last Picture Show— and it was like his second movie ever. And his first movie was they gave him a bunch of scraps of footage of Boris Karloff. And we're like, can you shoot 20 minutes around this and make it a narrative? <laughs> right. But this was his first time like writing a script and shooting it. And Bob Rafelson was producing it. And he shoots the scene where Timothy Bottoms and Jeff Bridges get in a fist fight over uh, Sybil Shepard at the end of the movie. Right. And the people at Columbia Pictures see the dailies and call up Bob Rafelson. And they're like, this kid's a moron. He doesn't know how to fucking shoot an action scene. This is incomprehensible. We're screwed. You have to go over and take over production. And he was like, let me see the dailies. And this is one of my favorite terms ever. But Bob Bob Rafelson says he called up Columbia and he was like, are you stupid? This thing's going to cut like butter. Oh, I Isn't love that, that gorgeous? That's that awesome. pretty sexy. I will say, if you didn't give me the setup of like, and I love this term, I would, and I still am, yeah. I'm just injecting that directly into my vocabulary. Totally. I'm like, oh, I got to remember that. But this is a movie that cuts like butter. And the reason why, and it's the same <laughs> thing that worked with um, Last Picture Show, is he was like, it was um, Bogdanovich's naivete, being such like a film critic and a film student and loving watching the construction of things but having so little experience making it himself, Mm -hmm. he didn't realize that the way anyone else would do it is choreograph a fight, shoot it from eight different angles. At every angle, you do the whole fight, and then you cut it together later. So what he did is he went, okay, so this shot, I'm close up right here, and this shot is just, when I say action, Bridges, your fist goes from here to here. Like he was just He knew what it was going to be. He knew what the end piece was. He knew what the end piece was. And so he did it in a totally disjointed way where they never did the full fight as actors straight through. But he got every piece he needed. And when you watch that fight, it has the same kind of energy that the Mad Max movies do, where every little piece has so much force in it because it is just focused on just that one piece, making yes. that thing play the best it can from that angle. And it's tough to do that and also make the performances feel cohesive and continuous because you're doing it so piecemeal. But somehow Miller just always has that like throttle of like, you know, and so much of this movie is someone looking at something, establishing the mm. next sort of danger, the next conflict by right. someone clocking, right. oh, who's at the window right. next to me? What's their Which spatial is relation? Like life in an apocalypse where there's no settlements. Right. Like that is what it is, where it's like, oh, somebody's coming down the road. What would right. that be? Yeah. Like, right. Oh, there's right. smoke over there. Right. That's weird. Yeah, That's exactly. not supposed to happen. Like, not, I think yeah, it's because it kind of like, there's a person there. Weird. There's never people there. Yeah, right. That's bad. It's usually not a lot of people around. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know That's if you're a bad guys sign. Hung out here. Right. <laughs> but like to do this at high speeds, like to do it in motion yeah. above all else. And, like, a lot of the times the cars are going, like, 60 miles per hour and they're speeding up the footage, you know? And I I am the first person to, like, dislike visible effects 
But the fact that it's practical with just a little bit of speed, yeah. it's and it's not used the whole time, but it's used at certain times, it really hits you extra hard where you're like, this doesn't bother me at all. No. 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 And it, it doesn't bother me at all when it's like weirdly takes off, when the car takes off. You're like, this is kind of no, cool, yeah. actually. Yeah. But, but it's like weirdly he's getting the performances out of his actors that also will play well at that speed, if that makes yes, sense. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know? Like everyone's got a certain energy. Yeah. I mean, I don't... This is not a performance movie for me, really, apart from Mel. Well, I mean, everyone's, you know, everyone's doing. Oh, bro, ah, ah, Bruce Spence is pretty fun. Thank you. Yeah, he's pretty good. That's Gyrocopter? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Which, back in the Star Wars days, I kept on bringing up that he is Tion Meadon in Revenge of the Sith. And every time I brought it up, you went, who cares? So here was the situation <laughs> He's in Revenge of the Sith. Right. Uh, he plays the. the uh, Tion right, Meadon. The, he's like, I mean, I'll show you what he looks he's like. He's got lines on his face and pointy teeth. Oh. Um. And right, Griffin was like, "And do you know who that is? He's the, gyro- the gyrocopter pilot from Road Warrior." And I was like, "All right, Jesus, who cares?" There he is. Oh shit! I mean, he's got a good vibe. Yeah. It's Bruce Spency, long yes. face. Yeah, tall, long face. He's then, al- he's also in Thunderdome. Yes, yes. And then Gethard was on the podcast. He tried it on him, and he was like, "What?" Who gives a shit? <laughs> and then, but he is, of course, also in a performance that matters a lot to me: mm-hmm. the evil train man uh-huh. in the Matrix Revolutions, and in Return of the King, he is yes. the mouth of Sauron. He is in yeah. a deleted scene, and, but, and yeah. so he's only in the special edition. Yeah, but yeah. that puts him in five different trilogies in the last movie, right? In Finding, four. In four. Finding four. Nemo, he is also... He's the, one of the sharks. Right. Yeah. There was a stat where in 2003... So if they made a third of those, then that would be a fifth trilogy. In 2003, he was the highest grossing actor. Yeah, right, right, because he had... Oh, yes, because... Uh, yes, uh, right. Star Wars, or <laughs> right. not Star Wars, but, you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, you know, the yeah. man was in some high earners. But but watching... The, the man was in, like, uh, $1.8 billion yes. worth of movies. Right, right. within, right. like, six months. <laughs> he was in, like, 2% of them, right. but, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But it was this crazy... Uh, his performance is really f- uh, great, because he's the in only this, person in yeah. this universe who is having fun, who has any yeah, joy. Yeah, who still seems sort of like a human, right? right. Yeah, 100%. And, and I feel like there's something to the fact that he is the only person that's ever in the air. Yes. So that makes right. it seem like... It seems he, like such an insane advantage. I it's know. an insane advantage, but it also gives him a different perspective than every single other person that exists in this world. Like, the so ground is sense. so dire in this movie. Right, but it makes it yeah. seem like, oh, that would be why he's got some positive, some yes. hope to him, because he can see, he sees more than everyone else right. sees. Yeah. Right. So he's got, like, a, a weird perspective. Also, do you think that uh, Stephen Merchant <laughs> saw this guy and was like, all right, when he was like zero, and <laughs> he's like, like, I'm gonna the yeah, machine. He's like, I'm gonna grow to be just like this. I dude. mean, he looks like George Miller designed him. His proportions, I mean, the size of his hands and the skin of his legs, he makes Jack Skellington look like Danny DeVito. <laughs> it is insane that this is his real body. It is, and he is really fun in this movie. He's so fun. Also, his head is four feet tall. It's, yeah. it's, it's the length so of long. the head that's all you of know, it. He had been in the cars that ate parrot. He'd been in some of these sort of. Small budget yes. Australian exploitation. What, what do you want to call them, movies? But but I will say this: you're saying it's, it's a movie not called Stork, which was like a breakout hit for some like comedy. Okay. You know, whatever. Uh, you were saying this is not really a performance movie, but watching the first and the second back to back, pretty much, um, it does make you realize that. As opposed to a lot of genre cinema, especially genre cinema coming out of like these sort of you know humble beginnings. Uh, the performances are often so wackadoo. You have people who cannot act or people who overact so much because they don't have respect for the material. And in this, even though it's a cranked up movie, it does feel like everyone is actually invested in the world. The people who have two lines, the people who are just in the background, even the people who aren't making a big impression, there's like an integrity to all what the actors in this. There's a, something to like, if you're in a movie and you only have two lines, you're like, who gives a fuck? Right. right. But if the lead only has 10 lines, yes. you're like, well, I guess. Like, right. I, I mean, I'm fair Gibbs, point. I, right. I have, I'm the fucking w- weird captain who has the 80s uh, blonde daughter. Right. Um, the mechanics but, assistant. The mechanics. Uh, the mechanics. It. The mechanics are the fucking uh, Statler and Waldorf yes. for this movie. <laughs> they're, they're, my, they're my comic relief. They're the Gildan, uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. I'm- but it's also one of those things where it's like probably the 14th build person in this movie still worked 35 days. Right, and mostly just like on a uh, dirt bike with right. a mask on in the back. But has like a dozen close-ups. Like because it is such a physical movie, all the supporting actors in this are so much more invested by the nature of what they have to do. Yes, I agree with that. My, I think one of my beefs is with 
and I hate to to say something mean about the Lord Humongous. Oh, I don't love the Lord Humongous. He's my least favorite Mad Max villain. Uh, I don't think it's even really a debate. Toe Cutter's so good. I mean, the, 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 the yes, two he's King better than the Lord Humongous. Are so good. Yeah, those are the right. best two. And then Tina Turner also kicks the Lord Humongous. It's like okay, I get you're big, you're a big guy, yeah. which it's cool. Yeah, he's hockey big. mask. I mean. You're not the first to do that, but okay. Although Maybe he is the first. Maybe he is Jason's the first. Jason's still wearing a sack. Jason might still have a sack. He might they, still have a sack. But at yeah, nonetheless, like a hockey mask. I'm Jason like, might be a kid in the bottom of the lake. He might be in the lake at this point. Kind of the opposite. <laughs> this guy's desert with a hockey mask, drinking sack but in like, the lake. The hockey mask is fine. It's good. Right. It's good. The fact that Lord Humongous is this huge bodybuilder who uses a pistol with a scope for most right. of the movie. You're like, it's like, get in the fucking... Like, yeah. He's he's all, he is a lot of bark. Oh, He's yes. a lot of like, oh, Lord Humongous is back. Yeah. You have two more chances to disobey me. <laughs> Debate me, you coward. <laughs> <laughs> Convince me otherwise in the public sphere. I'm planning on leaving soon. I mean, he's scary. Yeah, that, one of my big beefs with most a- action movies is they always get like a big actor to play the villain. You're just like yeah. a big guy. Yeah, yeah. What, no, not even oh, I don't, oh, I mean, oh, like a, oh, a, a major more, name. Right, okay. An overqualified thespian. An overqualified right, right, right. thespian. So that by the time, like, by the time Steven Seagal is squaring off against a bad guy, you're like, Steven Seagal's going to kick this right. 60-year-old guy's ass. Like, Tommy Lee Jones is supposed to be scary. Right, right. He just fought 100 Navy SEALs. Now he's going to fight Tommy Lee Jones? Who cares? Right. The ultimate example of that for me the is- The and Under Siege 2 is a great big example. one. I think there's yeah. an even more egregious <laughs> Go one. Ahead. The, the one plenty. I just remember there going like, this movie should end right now, is Quantum of Solace- where the film expects you to feel any tension in a final fight you, that is Matthew, Daniel uh, Marie- Craig on a catwalk <laughs> with Matthew Ulmerich, <laughs> who's like, I am an eco-terrorist. I, you know, B- Bond has had <laughs> a few of those the problems, internet. like Jonathan yes. Price in Tomorrow Never yeah. Died. I mean, often when you have the uh, ineffectual, you will have, they'll have a heavy, you know. And, and then they, right. and you, you and give that's them the a heavy. They right. do the order wrong, right. where you fight the martial, the badass martial artist who's his sidekick is like, I defeated him. It's like, now you have to fight, you know. Jonathan Price in yeah. a Nehru collar. Lead the yeah. weapon Right. Two's got the best one. Uh, he kills that guy. Uh, he fights that guy, and yes. then he's like, "Now you have to fight me, the f- old fat South African man." Yes. <laughs> Robocop is like Robocop. A Robocop. Yes, yes. There's a, wait, there's yeah. another. Well, I mean, Haywire makes the very strange decision of having Ewan McGregor be the final boss. Like, no yeah. offense to him. Haywire but also she's makes, already dispatched right. like Channing Tatum, like yeah. bigger yes, guys. Yeah. Like, it's weird. Haywire also makes the weird decision to be uh, totally incomprehensible. <laughs> yeah, but that that I love. Yeah. Right. But so then you see this movie and you're like, oh, finally, a fucking right. bad guy worthy of a hit. Yes, hip. he's uh, big. Yeah, he's, this is going to be awesome. And then you're like, sort of never deal. Oh, yeah, he it doesn't kinda, matter if you're a bodybuilder if everything you fight is in a fucking weird... Uh, what are they called? Fan boat turned car or whatever. Wait, but the, the first one has that thing <laughs> he, too. He's got those Mississippi roots. He can't let him go. That, that, what if that's the backstory? He's, he used to be a fan boat captain. The first one has that thing too. He's like a Cajun where, guy. Yeah. Where uh, Toe Cutter gets killed. Yeah, he gets killed penultimate. Yeah, it's right. true. And, and the same happens in Fury Road. He totally. doesn't care about the hierarchy. Of, no, like, right, right. You know, what, you, you know, you might get hit by a truck and that's, you know, and, that's and it's because they set up a different, because, right. uh, this movie and Fury Road, ostensibly too, isn't about the needing to defeat or banish the bad guy. Right. It's about it's chase crossing thing. the finish right. line. Yeah. Right. And it's right. also about these are the guys who like open the gates of hell. So ultimately, it's not that stopping them the problem. It, the problem is everything that they've unleashed. Right. right, right. You know, and then also you have like you have an endpoint you got to get to. You gotta you gotta do a delivery. Right. Um, I do like his uh, prosthetic uh, uh, pulsating veins on the back of his head. Well, here, so do you know the original plan for him was no. that he would be Goose? He would be Max's old buddy from Mad Max One, gotcha. who gets all burned up. Yeah, uh, but you never see his, you know, corpse. No. I guess you I see mean, his does, arm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's why he's burned. Okay. They were like, let's do that. And then I think someone was just like, it doesn't make sense, so don't do it. And or it's also there's cooler no room to just be it. like, who the fuck is this I, guy? I agree. I think it would I be a little too much to have yeah. it be. Yes, like, I, I love the fact that you don't know who any of these. You you're don't even some really, fucking asshole. You yeah. don't even know their motives at right. all. Right. Except that like gas is important and you That's want the it. They have it. They need <sighs> it. In too. the Mad Max world, all you need to do is like find gas or water or something. Yeah. And then be like, okay, I am Lord fuck you and I'm the boss. You all answer to me now. And that's it. I it's think, futile. You I know. think one of the reasons why I love the Mad Max franchise so much is it's the only piece of media that seems to find cars as terrifying as I do. Right. 
as someone who will never get a driver's license, does not like being in a vehicle. Oh. The idea stresses me out. Like watching this movie is how I feel every time I'm in an Uber. <laughs> I'm just like, someone's going to fucking ram into us. It's too much. You know, like no one should have this much power in their hands. No one should control this much like fucking muscle. Uh, Dom Dierkes used to have this stand up bit that was really funny. He was like, in like 40 years, kids are going to be like, so you were just like in these 5,000 pound death machines going 80 miles an hour next to each other? That's how I feel. <laughs> yeah, and they were it like, is, <laughs> I mean, it's the old joke, but right. Anytime right. you're driving a car, and you're like, what if I just like. Right. You know, like, like, yeah. And you're like, oh, well, thank God I have like a fully working, working cere cerebral cortex and I'm not going right, to do that. Right. Right. Uh, for Wait example, I do not have a fully working cerebral <laughs> cortex and do not have a driver's license. Smart. Out of a Stay sense of compassion road. for the human race. <laughs> but but this movie, like the way they just in the prologue set up so beautifully. Yeah. Like, because the first one you're watching it and society hasn't fully collapsed, but you're like, there is a weird dominance of vehicles. Yes. You know, it's, it's like a pre sort of Pixar cars thing where it's like the scales are starting to like unbalance between the natural and the mechanical. And then the second one just sets up this whole thing of just like we got all into machines, like everything was all about machines. And we went into war and then realized, oh, fuck, we blew our machines trying to win the machine. Yes. War. <laughs> right. And now society has crumbled. And the only thing we care about is how to keep the machines running. Right. It's just such beautiful table setting. Yeah. And to just have some old man over like stock footage of World War II explain <laughs> this. You're like, I get it. It's the type of self-destructive thing that humanity does. It's, the movie is so oddly poignant. Yes. Watching it now, you're like, this is crazy. You're like almost crying just in the opening narration, which yeah. is like their version of the Star Wars crawl. But the guy is really imbuing it with a sense of real sort of pathos about like, of course, we did what humans do, right. you know? And, and this idea where it's just like, it's just, it's all about fucking guzzling. Like, just let's hammer the point. Let's underline that this movie's about one thing. Everyone's got to get guzzling. Guzzling? Guzzling. I'm sure we talked about it in the last episode, but, you know, there have been all these gas crises in Australia mm -hmm. and things like that. You know, that was what inspired him. Ding dong. Ding hey. dong. Ding dong. Open that door. Okay, I'll check the door. Creak. Where is he? Where's who? Where is Show Exotic? Oh my, are you Carol uh, Baskin, maybe? Yes, it's me, Carol Baskin. Don't be uh, silly. And you're from that Netflix show. Yeah, I am. I'm not very okay. happy with the way they depicted me. Uh, it was a little scandalous, but yes, uh, that is me. Um, have you seen Show Exotic anywhere? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I can barely keep track of what's going on with you guys, but... Um, Why? Didn't you watch the show? You should somewhere. know everything about us. You haven't seen the show I haven't yet? Watched, I haven't watched the Tiger show yet. Well, what else do we want to talk about, though? Well, I, I you know, I was going to do some complaining, if I can. Okay. Yeah, you're allowed. Joe Exotic's campaign of terror has continued. He will not let me rest. Even my bed is no longer safe because he destroyed oh. my most beloved pair of sheets. My bed sheets that, of course, were cat print are now ruined. And I have to assume that Joe Exotic is the culprit because he burned them. OK, I understand that. But would you agree that if you made some small changes to your everyday life, maybe improving your bedding, it could turn your bed into a comfortable retreat? How could my bed get any better? I just told you I had cat print sheets. Yeah, well, Brooklinen, the internet's favorite sheets, is home to bedding, loungewear, towels, and more with over 50,000 five-star reviews and counting. What? Oh my God, That's, that sounds like they're almost as popular on the internet as I am. Exactly. And they're, you know, I've got, my whole house is Brooklyn and Central, okay? I've got the sheets, I've got the towels, I've got a bathrobe. I'm wearing Brooklyn and pants right now. Wow. This stuff is direct to consumer bedding, okay? It works directly with manufacturers and directly with customers. There's no middlemen, so it's luxury products without I luxury hate middlemen. I hate middlemen. Absolutely. Exactly. All their stuff super soft. The towels are super plush, okay? The loungewear. Wow. You can get wow. I didn't masks, kill my robes. husband. Wow. Sheesh. Okay. Well, I mean, that's good. 
That's yeah, no, what were you trait. saying about the shit? I just felt like that was important to mention. We all like to mention that every once in a while, right? You haven't killed your husband, right? No, I haven't yet. Um, yeah, and I didn't kill my husband either. So we're just two people who have a lot in common. Tell me more about these sheets. Well, Brooklinen, it's just really uh, beautiful home essentials that don't cost an arm and a leg. You can pick all kinds of patterns and mix and match. And listen up. It's the perfect place to start making small changes that make a big difference. Brooklinen.com. Brooklyn is so confident in their product that all their sheets, comforters, loungewear, and towels come with a lifetime warranty. <laughs> lifetime, that's good. I mean, it'll take you right up until your husband's untimely death. With that said, you can get 10% off your first order and free shipping when you use promo code check only at brooklinen.com. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com, promo code check. And uh, yeah, uh, it's everything you need to live your most comfortable life. Now, David, you said a lot of different patterns. Do they have cat print? I'm not sure. Uh, it's more of a sort of stripes, you know, various colors, things like that. Um, oh, so I maybe like Maybe that's stripes. something they could work on. But uh, yeah, they've yeah. got stripes. Bye, David. I love you. I didn't kill my husband. Feral Child, by the way, we haven't shouted him out yet. Uh, you know, with the boomerang. Yeah, yeah. No, cool guy. <laughs> you were looking at me confused, and I was no, like, clarify, John, John, please. he's got the boomerang. <laughs> please clarify which character is yeah, the which feral one child. I'm trying to... <laughs> no, I was going to say, he must have learned to speak quite eloquently. Very eloquently. Because I love that reveal. Like, yes. I, how am I? I? There's no surprises left in movies anymore no. for me. And then when it's just something small, like, and I am the narrator, you're like, Oh, that's fucking cool. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know why I liked it so much. It is such a classic twist. I will. Do, are you remembering that that is the final twist of Taruk the Last Flight, the, the first flight? Right. The, uh, the um, Avatar Cirque du Soleil show that we of saw. Of course, you live, saw. I'm sure you saw. Where, like, you're watching the Cirque du Soleil, you know, they have a whole Avatar adventure, and there's a narrator, and then at the end of it, he's like, and by the way, that guy is me. I'm blackout. him <laughs> later. <laughs> It like was great. hard blackout waiting for people to go like yeah. <laughs> lights back up to him like this <laughs> to people slowly walking out <laughs> anyway um, yeah Feral Child bit of a Ben vibe from Feral Child right did you ever have a boomerang <laughs> I did. Yeah. I actually one time it hit my friend in the head he had to go to the hospital oh come on Ben it wasn't but like I mean, was doing it on just purpose. Like, <laughs> we were doing <laughs> American <laughs> like, Gladiators. Did you even throw, did you throw and it? I lined up. He was next to me, and I was going to throw the boomerang, and I guess I kind of it kind of let go, and it went right into his head. Oh, Point boy. blank range? Yeah, it was close. What, it was, ty what type of injury are we talking about here? Not a metal boomerang, I'm hoping. I'm no, hoping it was but wood like or a hard plastic. plastic. Yeah, yeah, sure, right. It wasn't good. He had to get stitches. Sure. I did. I felt bad. Yeah. But yes, I've had a boomerang and I've thrown them many a time. B ben, what was your American Gladiator name? Oh, wow. I don't know. I mean, I think it was who was my favorite guy. Yeah. yeah. It was either Nitro, Laser, or Tower. <laughs> <laughs> I had two goldfish that I wanted uh, the Belmore Street Fair that were named <laughs> Nitro and Laser. I think I was mine so was Nitro. Yeah. yeah. Those were the two coolest guys, yeah. I thought. Yeah. 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 American See, Gladiator feels indebted to Mad Max too. I mean, like everything's that feels. It, but I mean, but yeah. it is wild. There was all Brit Britain had its own gladiator. It was just called Gladiators. What? But did you read this in some sort of book? Or? Yeah. <laughs> Are you like a big gladiator guy? In England, yeah. they didn't have American Gladiators. But <laughs> once in a while, it would what? cross over with the American, and they would show up and they'd be like, "Hi, I'm Nitro," and the Brits would kind of like, be like, "All right, buddy." <laughs> I'm picturing like the British sports like. Oh, I'm Earl Grey, and he's like, and he fuck, and it's like about Raleigh fingers, yeah, mustache, it's all oh, biscuit, <laughs> yeah, it's no, all about kicking soccer balls and shit. And like, <laughs> it was the I mean, as far as They're I know, it was it gloves. was a very similar show. They did the like yeah. the, the jewels with yeah, the yeah. right, except with spats on. Um, but there was a character called Wolf who oh. had uh, mm. long hair, uh -huh. yes, and he was like the bad guy, yeah. So like everyone else was really nice, which is sort of weird to think about. That's what Gladiator was like. They would joust and maybe one wins and they'd be like, how do you feel about that hunter? And he'd be like, oh, he's a great competitor. I had a great time. <laughs> but Wolf would like eat the microphone or be like, I'll get you. You know, it was great. I loved Gladiators. What I a weird, they did try to bring it back. They, I remember, it was one of those like things the where they like brought it back. I feel like during the writer strike when they needed like right. a ton of programming. Like, Jesus, I don't but know. But Ninja Warrior eats its lunch yeah. so hard. Right. It's, like, it's a little more hardcore. Yeah. Right. And then 
Gladiators starts to feel goofy. It starts to feel sure. childish with some of the events. Which I mean, it's for it children. Yeah, yeah. Right? It was very childish. Yeah. There was a dude. And he's like, uh, he's got his own Wikipedia page. I wish I could remember his name, but he was the guy who like, oh, sh- uh, Russell Crowe. <laughs> yes, yes, that's yeah. what it is. The guy who uh, uh, threw a phone. No, he. Uh, this dude showed up on Gladiators on American Gladiators and was. Such a fucking stud. He could, like, no one could beat him in anything. And he yeah. was just like, you know, it was like, and Gary wins again or whatever. This, like, tiny little black dude just smoking <laughs> everyone in every event. Like, they just never dealt with this. They were like, it was like uh, Ken Jennings. Like, they were yeah. like, we need a robot to fight him in the joust. He could just beat everybody in everything. It was very fun. Did you guys have the Travelator? Did you guys have that? No. What do the you mean, end- you guys? We all grew I up, grew in, the up same in Britain. Country. What? Oh. Holy Reveal. shit, I haven't, heard, I haven't heard that in 30 episodes. Jeez. <laughs> where I watch... That's only because we're 30 episodes. Where I watch the, <laughs> <laughs> the British gladiators with uh-huh. Wolf and Hunter and Jet and Nightshade and all the other ones. Nightshade? Nightshade. Tom Brady's worst nightmare. Nightshade, unfortunately, <laughs> was the, the, the black woman. No! The, the, no! And guess what they called the black man? No. Shadow. No! (laughs) So bad. Oh, my God. It's just like when I was a kid, I'm like, right, yeah, Black Ranger and Yellow Ranger. It's a black guy and Asian woman. Pink Ranger's the girl. Yeah, Yeah. that makes sense, (laughs) right? You know, I'm a child. I have a very, uh, you know, impressionable brain right now. This is what I should be watching. Can I move backwards in conversation and make a joke that's not worth it? Yeah, Yeah, please. please. I thought Tom Brady's worst nightmare was an air pump. Oh, the one thing Griffin knows about I was about just about football. to say. Thank you. Griffin, <laughs> Griffin dipping his toe into sports humor for just, the first time. I'm just Lesson stunned. learned. I know one other thing about football. Anyway. <laughs> Tell the truth. Tell the truth, of course. Tell the truth. In the end of the big gladiator, they did like a big gauntlet run at the end of every show. Uh-huh. The last thing, they, you know, they had to climb a thing and do a thing, you know, but the last thing was they just had to walk up a backwards escalator, essentially. Yeah, they had to run up a treadmill yeah. that was going down. Which yes. was... That's the always, travelator. That was called the travelator, and it was yeah. always... It was so hard, and I always appreciate. It. I'm like that. It's so simple, <laughs> but so fucking difficult. Do you, do they you, would, and also American gladiators. I don't know if uh, uh, gladiators with a U at the end <laughs> had this, but <laughs> Her Majesty's gladiators. <laughs> I don't know if you guys had this, but the fucking. It was all the going through the paper door where there's yes. sometimes yes. a guy there and sometimes someone not there. Yeah, that's just like the. If you have, the, if you choose one with the guy, you lose. Yep. Like, <laughs> yep. No, it, it had the breakaway paper. Yes, I mean it was a good show. I enjoyed it. Tennis ball, air guns. You right. just yeah. can't a lot get of that. those. A lot yeah. of that. The assault, just get those. The assault as a kid was the best one. There where was, you're like, you shoot the rocket launcher. Yeah, you throw yeah the, that uh, was. Yeah, yeah. Did, did you guys have uh, what they called Atlas spheres, where you were in like a giant mouse yes, ball? Yes. That one was cool. Yeah. 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 Um, and then Powerball was the one I always thought I would be the best at, which was kind of like rugby, but with like a slam dunk. Oh in yeah, the middle. right. Yeah, yeah. Bring it back. Why yeah. not? I yeah. don't know. I, I don't know. I feel like they did that revival. You're right. American it, Ninja Warrior, right. That it, now American Ninja Warrior yeah. and space. like the yeah. CrossFit games like eat the lunch of all this. I also, right. I feel like. Uh, uh, I also think, no offense to the gladiators, but it's probably like a steroid situation I think so. happening over there. They all looked very large. I also <laughs> feel like the American Gladiators reboot came in a slight lull period for the WWE, which has since swung back really hard. Yeah. And it's just so dominating I would, yeah, that world. Zoom out from WWE to even just say professional wrestling because now sure. there's yes. so many no, other so shows. Many Right, yeah, right. I think no one wants that. Um, do you know the thought I had watching this movie? It is insane that this is almost 40 years old. Yep. And there is still not a, a stunt category at the Oscars. I know it's a thing that gets discussed a it lot. Does, but you're right. But this is the fucking point where they should probably go, oh, this is this is a thing we need to acknowledge. Because yeah. this yeah, is like the birth of a, more, a modern type of stunt movie. This is the birth of a type of movie where you have like 80 people doing insane things that defy logic. And- Real people doing real stunts right. with real fire right. and real cars. Yeah. It's just like, and I don't know if it's because I've watched all these classic action movies for Action Boys or because of just modern uh, movies. I'm so tired of CG and yeah. uh, and the Disneyfication of everything that, like, watching this movie is like a fucking antidote. To, That's like, what's crazy. Come, you're like, watch this, you're like, Dude, when that one biker who I think, uh, according to uh, IMDb, actually breaks his leg because he's yes. not supposed to hit the car and he's doing like those right. like rag dolls. Right. Oh. And I'm like, you watch that, you're like, holy shit. Now, that's insane. Someone actually got hurt. Apologies. Yeah. But if he didn't get hurt, that's still a dude soaring 30 feet through the air. And, and what's crazy <laughs> like, is- And that was the intention. Oh, he wasn't supposed to hit understand the- it. He wasn't supposed <laughs> to hit the car, but he was supposed to definitely fly 30 feet as a person. Right. And that's fucking 
awesome. That person made that choice to do that. Right. That, you know, right. I, I respect it. It just as if like it's. I'm not. A, I'm not a director. Yeah. But as a director, that would frighten me so much. Like the days oh. you have that shit to do. Oh, but, I know. But, but here's what's crazy. He's made four of these movies. Sure. And I believe, and I was trying to do my research on this, it seems like the worst injuries that anyone's gotten on any of them is like that, is like a broken bone. Yeah. You know, like a, a badly like harmed uh, limb, but nothing that you couldn't recover sure, from. Sure, no one died or anything. Yeah. 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 There's yeah. like, I was reading an article two days ago about the amount of people who have died making Resident Evil movies. Really? You know, because they got like that Bulgarian loophole or whatever just that they're shooting outside shit. of America. Right. Like, right. I mean, and like, just poor and, and planning. Norton, and Norton and, almost right. took down a fucking uh, Harlem apartment or Brooklyn apartment. I mean, like make... two firemen got killed. I mean, it's one of these things that sort of speaks to George Miller, where it's like even the first one where he is like, in retrospect, we were like playing with like death a lot. I, you know, we got really lucky that no one got more hurt. But from then on, he becomes very aware of like, if I'm going to ask people to do this, we have to plan out so deliberately. I have to be very specific in what I'm asking them to do. I'm not going to ask them to use, do footage I'm that, not going to use. Here comes that time shit again. It's all about the time. Like, so that's if, you, his if he uses his money for days, like right. that's what you're talking about when you say time, right? right. He just takes days. Correct. And it's so, like we for might stunt have to, shit. Like that's right. a dream. And yeah. especially when you're like traversing large, large patches of land, the reset time for this stuff is crazy. The stunts are complicated enough. There are enough moving pieces. There are explosions and stuff that like I was reading this article about this woman lost her arm making the last Resident Evil movie because they didn't like the way the shot looked on playback. And they decided, hey, camera guy, let's change the timing of your move by two seconds and didn't communicate it to her. And as someone who has been on set, I'm sure you can relate to this as well, John. I read that and I go, holy shit, I know that moment. I know that moment. I've never been in that moment where the stakes are that great. I've done it where I'm like, this is I'm set up to fail here. Totally. But not die. Right. Not and, to get hurt. And to it's, fail is I'm not going to land this joke. Right. Because and, they're like, right. Oh, and because they leave you out of one piece of conversation. Right. Or you're, you're not even being considered. There was a time when we were filming Tick where they had a big crane and the director wanted to change the timing of when the crane moved. And because of that and the rush and we're being like, we have to go, we have to go. The crane completely smacked Serafinowicz upside the head. And thankfully, it was not any sort of serious injury, but he was super freaked out by it, right? Right. And he's had the insulation of wearing this dumb machine <laughs> on his head, right? Yeah. But it was one of those things where it was like, that was just a product of people being like, we don't have time, just speed it up, speed it up, speed it up. And a movie like this, where you have so many complicated shots, so many cranes, things in the air, things on the ground, things mounted to vehicles, things being hand held, moving at high speeds with people jumping yep. and explosions and all of that. The fact that their track record for injuries is so great that it is so low, here's, I think it's something you got to give him credit but for. But here's my question. What? If Are they just a, lying? Well, possibly. They, that does seem to be something that happens all the time where it's like much later they're like, yeah, actually, like sixteen people fell off a cliff, uh, but they're okay now. Like, it wasn't but, technically during a stunt, right? So. right. <laughs> yeah, but I'm like, not talking about that. Yeah, I'm, you're saying a stunt Oscar, but would we measure a stunt Oscar by like most people put in death's way <laughs> who didn't die? Like, no, would it be I a mean, stat thing? How do you measure? I am a su supportive of a stunt Oscar. Yes. but how do you measure the sort of like? artistic, you know, uh, craft I, I of a stunt, I think you treat right? it you like know. best choreography. Well, you would, I assume you would throw it, you know, you would have stunt members be part of the Academy, and right. but like the way the Oscars work, right. like, you know, the peers well, but would like, decide. For example, but it's sort of like, yeah. what, what is, is what's crazy. the metrics right. for sound design? You right. know what right. I mean? Well, like, that, that's, I love to think yeah. about those guys being like, oh yeah, no, no good popping. <laughs> David's good, holding good, his good headphones. Pullets. Yeah, because right. yeah, it's oh, like, people are always just like, well, what movie has great cinema, like, what movie has a lot of Cuts. Yeah. That's, yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's that best editing. Be, yeah. right. Unfortunately. What, what, what right. movie has a lot of sound? That's Especially best sound when you design. throw it to the, right. um, to the general body. Right, because the, the, I mean, the sound yeah. Oscar almost always goes to a movie with a lot of vehicles it's or a movie with a lot of music. or war. Or Sometimes yeah. music. Right, yeah, the walk but, the line sort of bohemian rap. Hel helicopters, though. Yes, right. If you got helicopters, that. then you, you could win a sound Oscar. But you're like, in what universe did Roma not win best sound but then you're in the also universe like where everyone's fucking watching on netflix exactly. and not hearing right. that there's like <laughs> right. waves over there yeah. yeah everyone's watching from the what's up ben <laughs> oh oh i feel that way about quiet place yes that sound it's incredible sound yeah i mean that's the whole Shh. oh attack sound. Incredible sound yeah. attack sound mm -hmm. um we, we refuse to move to the waterfall <laughs> It, for for me, just fucking pick up your shit and move there. The thing we always joke about because uh, it's the best part is when he, when they show Krasinski's like uh, layer where he's planning everything. There's like on the whiteboard it says like they dislike sound with like a circle around it. It's like we got it. Attack like, sound. We do not need attack to attack sound. Yeah, yeah. Attack sound. Can you imagine how good 
he felt the day he figured that out. <laughs> yeah, right. He's like, we should have that. In the oh, it's not the smell thing. It's the sound thing. <laughs> well, I can stop we rubbing can call- dog shit all over my body. <laughs> we can call off the three months of smell experiment. Every morning, the kids I- are like, no more dog poop dips. You're like, no. Now, nope. now I have Every to- morning, I wake up and shit on my baby. <laughs> Here we go. Creature. Blind, attack sound, armor, how many in area? What is the weakness? <laughs> right. <laughs> Look, he's a good father. He's not particularly good at whiteboards. That's what That's that movie really, is about. That's really funny to me. <laughs> but I just feel like the, I, I mean, the reason why this movie doesn't feel like a dry run for Fury Road, you know, it doesn't feel like it's just sort of uh, outmodeled by Fury Road, is that you cannot believe that they did all of this in this time period without any digital effects. Yeah. And Fury Road is still more practical than most movies. Yes. Right. But he's has. embellishing yeah. everything. Yeah. Right. And this, you're just like, on the budget they had, the time you had, when there's no model for this, when people really haven't done a movie like this before. I mean, where essentially the movie is pretty much one long action sequence. Right, yeah. You know? To- or it's like, it's kind of two. Yeah. There's the, the stuff at the beginning. There's kind of a pause as we like meet... What uh, you know, Papa Janus? Well, it's like act, Papa Gala, the leader yeah. of the, the, Act the, One the and Act Three are action right. sequences. Act Two is like, here's who everybody is. Yeah, and here's everyone is. And they're like, we, you know, and he's like, oh, I don't want to help you. All yeah. right, I'll help you. You know, right? Which is sort of the classic. But that's Max Fury dynamic. Road is like two chases too. Yes, yeah, essentially it is. They, the right. thing that's wild about Fury Road is that the the pause in the middle is just in the middle of nowhere. Right, it's yes. not like he gets to a city and meets new people. Right, right, right. The breath is just so like they're just like. <sighs> he is so good though at sort of structurally knowing when to slow things down. I was literally just about to say, but when I saw right. when you watch Fury Road on IMAX in the theater, when it stops in the middle of yeah. nowhere, you are like. Oh, it's, okay, yeah, all I, right, like stretch my, oh my God, I just realized I've been crunching my shoulders right. for one hour. Griffin was at the press screening with yeah. me, if you remember. It's the first, yes. it's the, literally at minute 30, there is a shot of the flare. They're going in like the tornado. The storm, the yeah. flare like goes to black and it's a black for like one second yeah. and the whole audience burst into applause. Yes. And it was an incredible moment. And then you heard and it was a press everyone audience. sigh. Like, yes, a hundred percent. Like exhale right. at the and same then, time. And then awesome. you have the, you know, the sort of small scale, really cool, we'll get to it. It was one of the best audience responses I've ever seen. It was also incredible because we were seeing it at like a press screening where we were like, it's I've traditionally not it's... the most vocal. Yeah. Well, yes. yes. A, that, and B, people were like, I've heard it's good. It had been at Cannes and right. everyone was like, it's great. But you can never trust Cannes because they've been watching all these movies right. about like Moldovan left and then they like, like see like solo and they're like there's like a laser gun <laughs> yeah, this right. thing's reinventing cinema <laughs> people forget like I how always, good always, like the kingdom of the crystal skull reviews were at right, a can yeah. I always think of like port in the storm at can right because right. it's just like I just watch eight black and white fi- and then right. like here comes bad, a movie but with they're just recognizable like, music in right, it, and, right. and you're like that was actually pretty good and it's like yeah but if, you you're saw, like, if you saw that movie last you would be like yeah that's what stuck stuck in your head or whatever George Miller's a functional filmmaker it's probably gonna be a better action movie than most but you don't know if Can liked it that much, if that's really going to translate. Well, no, so his like, last yeah. credit was Happy Feet too. Yeah, it right. just wasn't something where you're like, this is guaranteed. Yeah. But this, it's like he's kind of creating everything. I mean, the only real forebear he has for what he's trying to do is the previous movie he made. Right. And like in terms of the larger storytelling themes, he's pulling from like Westerns and samurai films. I mean, he's doing like a very Cambellian thing. As he's, you know, he's. But very stripped down. uh, He does credit like Joseph Campbell and all that stuff. I mean, yeah, it's got denial of call. It's got everything. Stuff. Yes, exactly. But it's it's amazing how he just, it's like, there is. It is so lean. It is so focused always. Yep. He hits those beats so efficiently. The movie doesn't tell you anything that you don't need to know. It has nothing extraneous, but it also feels like there's so much going on around it. Like he's this one filmmaker who I feel like is able to be completely maximalist Max? and minimalist. Mad maximalist? And mad minimalist right. at the same time. You know who's the person, that the people who are really influenced by this? And I... Saw them say this in an interview, and then watching it today, I really, really saw it. Who? The Coen brothers. Mm. Oh, that makes sense. They talk about how this and the first Mad Max were like the two films they studied obsessively I mean, going the into. Gyro Captain is is oh, like yeah. just so close to like a random Coen brothers character. The moment when Gyro Copter's having the extended conversation with the dog about right. snake recipes right. is yeah. a moment that you feel like right. this would be in so many modern movies. It's and. 
this is the most unbroken dialogue in the movie. Yeah, it is. Right, <laughs> like from right. one character. You're but right. Raising and you're Arizona. Like, this is interesting. Yeah. Raising Arizona is like comedy Mad Max. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it has that sort of like anarchic energy and like the nonstop movement and all of that. And then you even go like they're serious films. Like even something like Blood Simple feels like they're they're the byproduct of like Howard Hawks and no, you're right. George and, and Miller. Blood Simple is very like again lean right. and economical and like, whether yeah, they're doing like a know. drama or a crime film or a comedy, mm -hmm. it always has that like Miller crank. And a lot of the visual like notes I feel like come from there's something about he his movies just look so expressive, mm. you know. I mean, there's yeah. those little flourishes he'll put in. The famous one is obviously the eyes bulging out and like the first Mad Which Max. I fucking love. Oh, I, you get a we get a uh, a little bit of that when the guy falls out of the truck. Yes. When yes. Uh, when yeah. in this one when Max opens the passenger side door of the truck. And yeah. The guy falls out. Yeah. It's just like that small moment. I know I mentioned the hand before the dog holding the bone in its teeth with the string attached to the shotgun and the gyro yeah. captain in the back. That is. Three seconds of the movie must have taken forever to set up and to get to work with a fucking sheltered dog like that. But that's like you choose that your priority is time. Right. And you get a movie that feels this deliberate where it feels mm. like – I mean he's talked about how he wants the Mad Max movies to feel like a literal fever dream. Like they mm. come out of mm. the dreams he has when he has like the flu. Yeah. And yeah. it does feel like when you wake up and you're like in cold sweat. Yeah, was that guy shirtless with a hockey mask screaming a Dutch <laughs> poem into a <laughs> microphone? Right. You wake up and you try to break down what the dream was, but while you're dreaming it, it all makes perfect sense. Right. You know? Yeah. And it is, right, which I love, right, not a movie that wants you to think about, like, and break it down and be like, oh, wait, why would they be, you know, there's yeah. no, there's no necessity. There's it's no, so he doesn't give you, he doesn't give you the time to ask questions and doesn't exactly. give you enough uh, leeway to like want to ask a question. There's not like a too much rope where you're like, wait a minute, why does this character care so much yeah. about this character? Because there is not a lot of that. But it's then when you have what's his name, Papalardo, the leader of the Warriors. <laughs> I just wanted to get it wrong. Is it, yeah, John Papsadera. Well, his, uh, his name is Papagallo. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nick Papa Giorgio. Got exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> when when he has that sort of scene with him where he's like, you've fully like succumbed to the madness of this world. Right. <laughs> like, you're telling us that, like, you're the same as us, but we've done what we need to survive, right, but to have, have maintained some hint of a, civilization. a surety exactly. and a sense of yeah. hope. Right. You are gone. Yeah. You're right. more like those guys. Right. And, and Max like, knows that because by the end, he's like, all right. Yeah. Like, I'll see you later. It, you know? it is one of the longest continuous dialogue scenes in the movie, and it is still pretty short and pretty sparse. <laughs> right. right. But it, it is it a basic statement of, like, here's so me, much. here's you. Right. That's what's going on here. But it's like he uses dialogue when it's something that you cannot communicate other than through dialogue. And it feels like it, he's, he's using it so sparingly. I mean, he always said that uh, his goal for the first Mad Max, and I feel like every movie since then he's just intensified this as the goal is to make a silent movie with sound. And the things he studies the most going into each one are like Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin. Well, that makes sense Boyd. for like elaborate stunts ela and elaborate visuals. Like yeah. it makes total sense. Like, Chaplin it was like these guys were like the original stuntmen. You know? And most they were of those movies shit. are like chase movies. There's yeah. usually some fucking cop with a nightstick like chasing after them. <laughs> yeah. My favorite stunt is when the house falls down, but they land like in the window. An yes. incredible guy. Yeah. So good. I was reading. I, I was uh, going through uh, <laughs> reviews of Blu-ray releases for these films because weirdly, for how much he controls the rights of these films, they. Uh, haven't gotten the kind of treatment in a lot of areas that most films that are creative owned and protected do. Like uh, the home video releases have never really been up to the level of how beloved these films are. Right, right. They haven't gotten like the criterion adjacent right. kind of treatment. And he's yeah. like never really done much merchandise, which is both good and bad. Uh, good in terms of artistic integrity, bad in terms of my apartment. <laughs> right. Uh, the Lord's, uh, Lord knows the box is Mad Max shit I would own if he made it. Um, but uh, this this Blu-ray review I was reading uh, that was just talking about the transfer, the guy just mentions in the middle of the review, like, I remember watching this as a child and going, what is this? These aren't even stunts. Right. This is just really happening. This feeling that you're watching it where just the amount of damage being like caused to vehicles, when they go to a wide shot of the desert and you just see 40 vehicles moving fast in the endless ben sand, his fist. caravan of destruction. You're it like, rules. this feels like the largest movie ever made. There's, yeah. there's five or 10 scenes where someone is just looking at something. And yeah. The thing that they're looking at 
is 12 independent vehicles moving in some way. Right. Sometimes it's like Max is just looking at the camp and two motorcycles are jumping off of ramps. Sometimes it's like three dune buggies chasing one person. Like they just constantly like, showing. How do you do this? That's just scary enough. There's I know. not even cell phones. There's not like. <laughs> well, as Griffin said, just driving a car is pretty scary. Terrifying. Yes. <laughs> to get like, like 40 people to do it, like in coordination with each other and a camera. Or driving a car with two people chained to the front right. of it, chasing another car, like being on the roof of a speeding fucking truck. I, this is all shit that those people were objectively doing right like, and when i <laughs> when i see the shots like that i go where is the crew you know like there's oh, one yeah. guy behind the I camera mean, that, operating it's the it. magic of fury road as well but yeah you're right it's crazy but i'm like where is the there are there the some crew? chairs set up somewhere because they're moving full but it's speed also, down the road <laughs> I, well that there is uh something uh behind the scenes thing to shoot max driving they had to build a rig on the outside of the car yeah. and shoot in and that's where the cameraman and the camera setup was. And they thought they had it all set up. And then they went over like one hill and that thing bottomed oh, out and sent sparks flying everywhere. And they were like, I guess this is just what the conditions are yeah. and continued to shoot like that. Wow. It's so awesome. I have not been able to get over Dominic's bit about how it's crazy that we all drive cars. I'm having like a slightly existential crisis You've about been just driving cars right Reeling now. into yourself the last no. 20 minutes. No, no, no. Welcome yeah, to my life. Go- this is how I feel all the fucking time. And yet I love driving a car. Um, I moved to Los Angeles and I've adjusted to being in my car big time. Like, David, the thing like about a New LA York that driver. freaks me out is, right, that you're in your car like hours a day like yeah. that is wild but yes i do have a car in new york i'm the rare new he Yorker. likes Whoa. driving people yes i love driving people i love driving places yeah i hate I flying so i've like doubled down on roads you know oh, i'm totally okay. cool with flying yeah it's See, so so weird that you're yeah, cool with flying. totally cool with flying mad max for me is like that's my like existential horror movie is like this world it's all cars. has anyone ever attempted like a planes mad max like an aerial Mad Max? I mean, I feel like not. Are you and saying like a, a Kevin Costner in a sequel to Waterworld called exactly. Air, Air World? World. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that kind of rules. Because kind of rules, right? Someone's really going to do that like eventually. A, like a blimp fight? Ooh, yeah. that'd be good. Blimps? <laughs> you know what would be cool, too, is if someone made a movie that was like like Star Wars. Like it was like Mad Max, but in space? Yeah, like this, spaceships. This can of mints is empty and I will whip it at your head. <laughs> like Star Wars. But when, when will there be Star Peace? I don't know. <laughs> Do you care about Star Wars gamers? I forget. Like you don't, you're not really give a shit about I, Star Wars, I, right? I, I used to really, I played, I did all the Star Wars shit, customizable card game, all the video games, loved it growing up. Yeah. Fell off during the, I was, I was really fucked up by Phantom Menace. Like, yeah, I right. wait, and I, then you were just like, "That's you didn't fine. Fuck I'll with leave it at the side there. of the road." Yeah. yeah, yeah. I didn't watch anything. I mean, I watched every movie, of course, sure. in the theater. But, but it was like in one ear out the other. Yeah, and yeah. I, I've I now reached that level with Marvel. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm at that point now where I find myself. I've never been really vocal online about the stuff I like, despite being a podcast host, because I'm just like, uh, whatever. But now I have to take the. Uh, well, I'm definitely less vocal about what I dislike. I, right. yeah. But now I take the time to be like, anytime someone makes a movie, like anytime the Safety brothers come out with, with Fury, anything yeah. that comes out and it's like not Disney and not. Uh, you just want to be like, God, let's put I'm this like, in a fucking pedestal. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. 1917. It fi- watch this fucking movie. Yeah, it's right. <laughs> not one superhero. In it. But, but like, that's the thing. Like the Mad Max movies, it could only be the result of one person having a very specific well thought out and well planned vision. Like that's the other part of it. It's not just like, oh, someone had an idea and then it got fucked up in the edit or whatever. Right. It's like he's making a movie that can only be constructed one way. Isn't so so fully in dialogue with itself yeah. that you couldn't even fuck it up if you took the footage away from him to an extent. You could make it worse, but you, you probably could definitely make it worse. But you couldn't make it I know what you're. I get. You know what I'm I saying. get your concept. There's a yes, there's yes. a fun game to play where you're like, oh, I would love to see so and so direct a Marvel movie. I would right. like to see so and so direct a Star Wars movie. Yeah. I don't think you should say that about Mad Max. Right. Right. I don't think anyone but no. George I mean, Miller should be directing. That's no. Auteurship. Like yeah. Pure, yeah. His pure right. auteurship. It's right. true. And and even as we were saying, like the fact that unlike all these other franchises, he never goes like, I'm gonna let you write like a novel. Right, he, he keeps it tight. That's he actually, he the stories of young watered down. He doesn't want to do like a Peacock original series or something like he that. Pro- well, you know what? Actually, probably he will. 
Yeah. Little Max. <laughs> Mad Max Babies. Yeah. HBO I mean, Mad Max. <laughs> I feel like didn't another little cartoon. That was funny. He's got to sell it to HBO Max. He's yeah. got to oh, sell it to HBO Max. He has to. I guarantee they're out to. I guarantee they're yes. out to George Miller. There's at least been an email. Yeah. yeah. We're like, we got to get you. Right, like, George. HBO I Max know. Fury Road, please. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, uh, what were some, let's let's run through some fucking great sequences yeah. in this uh, in this movie. Well, the the first big feral kid sequence is so great when it's taken so much effort to like get to the compound. Yes. Yes. You know, he finds this guy, he saves this guy, he's willing to bring him back and go through the trouble because he knows there'll be some gasoline in it for him. He gets back to the compound. Uh what's his name? Jez and the golden child oh, and Wes. all these people. Wes. 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 They all- Wes is visible butt cheeks. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh he's the Mohawk fella. They all follow him there, and then this stinky kid comes out and just fucking massacres them with three throws of a boomerang. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Cuts, kills Golden Boy, cuts the fingers off Toadie, yeah. Yeah, and then disappears into a I rattle. really appreciate to- the inclusion of Toadie. Like, that not everyone is like, I am just a tough guy who rides a motorcycle. Right, right, right. There's this still space for him. Yes. That I yeah. think he invented that's like future dystopian jester, right. like comic Haunted. relief. Yeah. 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 It, you, see it, you see it in Waterworld, which rips this movie off a ton. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. But like you see that in every post-apocalyptic movie. Yeah. And then eventually, every action movie, every group of baddies features the... Uh, ba- the books. <laughs> the guy who's exactly. like exactly uh, the guy who has weird wireframe glasses or whatever. I think Die Hard's yes. the great example. The yes. black dude who's just like, yeah. and we're in. Yes. You know, like, the most uh, annoying character in the history. Right, right. <laughs> I love that character. Or, but well, the most annoying performance, maybe. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. But like, that's the character that's going to get you into the Fast I franchise. Know. That's the character that's going to get you. That's into the, the thing. Movie. Fast, of course, has had versions of that, but then they've never had a big one though, which is the one reason. Well, I also, felt, I still then they were like, oh, let's have a nerd in this one. Can she be played by the hottest woman in the universe? Yeah. You know, like that's the Vin Diesel note where he's like, I saw Natalie Emanuel in something. Like, let's have her play a computer. They, they have like the <laughs> like the nerdy sort of like squirt uh, uh, body shop worker in the first movie who's like part of the family. Right, right. But it's like right. nerdy on a relative scale in comparison to them. Right. But I feel like they still haven't gotten that diehard archetype in there. But yeah, which I is mean, what I want to I mean, be. And you want to be James gotta, Gandolfini and killing themselves. You've got a DD. <laughs> You know, you want to be Benedict right Wong and Gemini Man. <laughs> yeah. You want to be Hawaiian shirt. Yeah. I know a guy. He's, yes, he's yes. the bard. He's an evil bard. I mean, that's what I love about. Yes, him. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great, it's a great archetype. All yeah. right, fucking rules. Yeah. It, it's just this thing. It, it's worm tongue. Sort yeah, of. It, it's always just kind of impressive that when you watch a movie that is this formative, that becomes this much of a dare I say it Rosetta Stone for other filmmakers. That uh, watching the first and purest execution of the thing always still somehow is more powerful than the people who have, in theory, perfected it with years right. and it, multiple tries. Well, it's you all, know? there's something about that. There's also something about watching the movie that created the references that you know. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. when you... Uh, when you watch The Godfather, if you watch it, like you're like, oh, now I get why people do so many different things. Like, right. so much shit Movies is unlocked like for you. Casablanca, where you're right. like, oh, yeah. I, oh. I, I see the invention of every trope. Right, right. right. Yes. yes, yes. Casablanca is an even better example because it's something Godfather's like a good one, you though. don't seek it out when you're a kid. Or like right. Uh, right. Yeah. people yeah. leaving the factory. That's one of those movies that everyone's ripping off because they had the idea to place a camera. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, then there's <laughs> train. We're going to put it right here. There's train. There's train coming into the station. Oh, it's going to come through that space. I can't see that in the theaters. It scares <laughs> the <laughs> shit out of me. <laughs> Wait, that uh, going. Has to- anyone spoiled that for you yet? <laughs> I, you know I can't watch is? the ending. I've, okay. yeah. I've watched the first minute of it and keep falling asleep. <laughs> the ending is fucking <laughs> crazy. Yeah. It's I got keep falling of- asleep watching it on Netflix. <laughs> right, yeah. Are sort you sort still got- watching? <laughs> Train's coming. <laughs> they pause 40 seconds right, in. Right. Are you still watching? It's sort of got the original <laughs> twist ending in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's it kicked M. Night Shyamalan yeah. off. He was like, wait a minute. Yeah. I didn't. I expected that thing to come right into the theater. Right. Because the twist ending was, I thought movies could kill me. <laughs> I've now learned they can't. <laughs> I was prepared to be if murdered by a time form. machine. I'd do a bunch of stuff, but one of them, I'd be like, let me. When when did they fucking first yeah, show that? Thing? Is that for real? That. Yeah, I, gotta like, be I would there, just like yeah. be in yeah. the back, being like, are they really gonna freak out right now? Like news stories are just everyone's like, this movie's got people scared. People are saying they're gonna bring their own trains to the movie theater, <laughs> yeah. and you're like, we had security's being doubled down on every theater as everyone pulls up in trains and engineering <sighs> outfits and stuff. You know what I would love to read? I'd love to read. Were there like reviews of the train coming into the station? Hated yeah, it, <laughs> guys. 
derivative. It lacks the nuance of Shakespeare. Yeah. Four point five. I don't think I the mean, movies are going to take sh- off. Yeah. I expect this to be a fad. <laughs> Only so many vehicles could be filmed coming towards a camera. <laughs> we know all the tricks now. Now I'm. Now I have to look up right? this stupid movie. <laughs> the other one I always think of is the kiss. There's that one yes. that's like two middle aged people and he has a disgusting mustache and they kiss and it's five seconds long and it was like fucking scandalous. Ah, oh, I can imagine. People were Dude. flipping the fuck out. You just made me think when you talked about that Fury Road shared audience experience, mm-hmm. that's something that a lot of people are losing. I don't want to be old man uh, yeah. movie podcast, but that's something a lot of people are losing and it's so fun when you can have that. I know. These days. Like it's not, it's even kind of rare because like even uh, the second event, Infinity War, yeah. whatever, I, I was tired of the movie by that point, but the the way the audience went apeshit. When, right. When yeah. Cap, it's when good Cap to Gr- feel an audience yes. feeling. It makes yeah. the movie yeah. better. makes every comedy totally. better. But I'll tell you the best version I've had of that recently was when I saw Eighth Grade in a crowded theater. <laughs> I swear to God, people, we watched it like it was a horror movie. Yeah. Well, the entire crowd going, oh, uh, like everyone awkward at the same moment. It was, I've never felt that shared. We're all best. cringing at the yeah. same time. Uh, like Jackass 3D is one of the best uh, the movie movies theater. are incredible to see with an audience. I feel like both of the Jordan Peele movies, at oh, least I got yeah. really good experiences. Horror is always, right. always a good one. Yeah. But it was like, we've talked about this, but just walking out of us, I saw a midnight showing in Times Square and people were standing outside the AMC 25 going like, so what do, you, what do you think the theme of that movie is? And I was like, this is amazing that he got people to see a horror movie at right. midnight. <laughs> right. And they're going to discuss People screaming it. and clapping and laughing. And at the end, they're like, so was that a metaphor for? I just want to say, uh, I saw eighth grade in a tiny screening room. And the only other person there was Peter Travers. It was a very strange Whoa. way to see that movie. <laughs> wow. I was fucking squirming in my seat the whole time. Because that movie really does make you squirm yes. in your they seat. Do such a good, it's like Cronenberg level reaction. It has yeah. one of my most uncomfortable like sort of like teenage experiences in it which is giving a present at the birthday party where everyone else is giving presents and then like opening she's gonna open all her and presents like, and, and she got her like a card game or something and has to be like oh it's really fun and she's like oh thanks and I was just like melting down yeah. in my seat the front porching of it too you're like uh, you, you can open yeah. mine later yeah. if you want yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. you gotta understand it's actually really fun bath. are you yeah. opening my uh, yeah. 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 Um, that's what but, kills um, it how hard she oversells that the game's oh, really oh yeah God. God. Oh, oh, it feels even so, in memory, it, it feels rough. too real. Yeah. Yeah. And that was one of the, of course, there are there are even rougher moments in that movie. But the, I was like, he's a genius that he gets those little moments, yeah. right? And it's like that's thing. awkward when you're forty. Yeah, exactly. You, it like, is. And that's you're what's right. cool right. about it is like right. that's awkward when you're forty and you're just like trying to. Hey, look, I got you this Funko thing, and Griffin. Yeah. I hope you like it. <laughs> I have it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I already own three do four years. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's the flaming guitar player, right? right? Yeah, it's yeah. Ben's favorite character yeah, of all sure. time. Because he's just like <laughs> he's drier than cannon? fire, baby. Yeah. But he's like the guy who had played the flute in front of the army. And I've always yeah. been like, what an insane person! A musician know. leading himself to die in war. That's what's kind of incredible, though. Is that yeah? Like, is there like a jerk in the army who's like? I like to shoot the flute player. Like, you know, like, when he's like ready, he's like, I don't know. I, I was trying to find that fucking flute guy. But me, I'm a fife guy. <laughs> it does feel like Miller is just so like, he's, you know, the dude's a fucking genius. He was a former doctor. He has a PhD. Yeah. He's a very thoughtful academic guy. Right. And it does feel like the fact that everything. And he looks like sort of like some sort of Santa Claus. Maybe. He has the like, glasses on the string. Yeah, the he little, dresses right. like a He professor. looks like right, some sort of Victorian librarian. Right. And there's something to the fact that like something like the Doof Warrior doesn't just feel like weirdness for the sake of weirdness because he is tapped into the fact that it's like. Nothing's weirder than the fact that we used to have actual fucking musicians on the front line. <laughs> right, right. Like yeah. every weird thing he's doing is yeah. only an insane heightening of something that humans actually do. But it or is, how we behave there's in the war. There's the two types. Right. You know, there's the the Guillermo del Toro types where you're like, oh, of course this guy makes horror movies. Where he's like, ah, oh, hello, yes, yes, I am a little creature from right. the darkness. Right. And then there's like the George Millers or Ari Aster where you're like, who's this like nice person? He's like, like a like, Muppet <laughs> English professor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ari Aster is a good example, like a dude who's like kind of funny and normal in person you're like yeah. oh what's your movie about it's like oh here take a yeah, look when Hereditary yeah. is at Sundance and like that's when no one knew who he was yeah. like all of the publicists were like just wait till they meet this guy and yeah. we were like oh is he like really fucked up and yeah. they're like no he's like, he's like really yeah, nice you, yeah you yeah. think you're meeting Rob Zombie <laughs> right. and you meet Rob Cohen yeah. accountant <laughs> it is this kind of incredible thing though that like the, these movies for how intense they are for how visceral they are 
They are not very violent in a traditional gory These movies way. are so famously violent and yet they are not right. They're not that intensely gory at all. So much of it is, is suggestion. Right. I mean, I know, so much I of it's know. the editing I mean, around things. Which is always the, it, that's always true. Like yeah. the movies that were so famously violent, psycho, whatever, you know, like when you yeah. watch them, you're like, yeah. right, no, this was all just people working themselves up. Like it's very suggestive. Right. There's not a lot of guts or whatever, but, you know, you know. But car crashes and uh, penetration yeah. from like yeah, sharp they, objects, they, they, the are, arrows and stuff. Make some tough, count, right? yeah. but but th- those are also two uh, very what's the word I'm looking for like understandable or triggering. Like yeah. we mm-hmm. we can know what a car crash feels like. We can know, yes. but when like someone gets their neck snapped in like a John Wick movie, you're like, I don't fully right. Under- this is yeah, of course it's visceral right. in the becomes, way that it's relatable. They're very yeah. visual too. I yes, mean, he's yes. always like it's easily visual trackable things. Um, Mel Gibson also is so good at playing pain I think it's that whatever the weird part of him that is so obsessed with like masochism yeah. and torture and martyrism oh, and whatever yeah. Yeah. That, that has come up in all of his films after this yeah. it, there's some connection to how innately good he is oh like, uh, right fucking Braveheart uh, uh, Riggs William Wallace right. Riggs no, these it, are characters is, that yeah. are like you want to see with blood on their face it, I mean, getting up again. And, and Hardy's good at it too. And I think that's like the commonality is both those guys, there's like, there's something kind of insane about these dudes. Yes. But the other thing he lacks, latches onto is with a film that's going to be really technical and piecemeal, you need someone who can really track their injuries and their damage right. and play them intelligently in every little piece. Because you're never losing track of how how much energy max has left right how much he's smarting from the last thing to happen yeah it is interesting he is you know not christ like exactly it's just because like as you say in his directorial career yeah they're always about these people who take like an unbelievable amounts of punishment right right and that is associated with like you know he's like this guy's so fucking tough right wouldn't believe which is literally his take on Christ, yeah. right, right. Is like this you won't believe bruiser. the shit they beat out of you this guy. You won't believe how many hit points the Son of God has. Right, he doesn't like. I mean, he, there's like m- seconds in that movie where he's like, hey, yeah. Also, I don't know. He had a couple things to say. People but were like, interested. Right. Mostly, he's like the fucking flesh they ripped out of his back. You know, but, the, but like the fact that Mad Max isn't that visually gory, and it no. also doesn't fetishize his pain. It it doesn't no, martyrize well, him that much because he's so like. Yeah, it's just yeah, him yeah. sort of enduring everything but they don't make that a heroic act in and of itself. Right. And it also is telling that, like, Mad Max is like this, like, Clint Eastwood man with no name figure where it's like, you don't know why he's this committed to saving this person or doing this thing. Yeah, And, and the no one ever he accomplishes digs it, too deep. He right. just leaves. Yeah. He doesn't want any credit. Right. He doesn't, like, bathe in it at all. Yeah. You know, he but just kind of disappears I think, again. I think that generation that's, a uh, you know, one uh, older than us that grew up on, like, Westerns and stuff, yeah. I feel like that's and uh and like from the male male perspective like the sort of machismo was you get the shit kicked out of you yeah. you don't react you finish your business right. and you're like right. I don't need a cake yeah it's not you know like and you just walk off like it'd be that, funny if he demanded a cake he's like <laughs> at it, the end it, of the it is my birthday <laughs> <laughs> the difference with Mad Max though like on that archetype is it's not look at how much punishment this guy can take and he's still cool under pressure right right it's that he's Mad Max like you can see that the guy is going insane right yeah the fact that he uh, by like design of him being able to survive out there, he must be insane. Right. Yeah. The fact that he can tolerate all this punishment and keep trucking loneliness is, <laughs> is is a byproduct of the fact that he is way post complete psychological break with reality. Right. Like he's lost everything in his life. He's lost all his human tethers in the first movie. Even if you haven't seen the first movie, if you're get, being sold this film just as the Road Warrior, it's all sort of implied of like this guy must have had something he lost. Yeah. You know. Right. But but it is that thing of just. It, it has broken this guy. This guy is not a paradigm of, of heroism. Like even his relationship with the helicopter guy. Yeah. They're kind of friends, but he's so removed from having actually like a real emotional relationship with this guy in any way. But even the feral yeah. child who you think in any other movie this becomes – Shane, or this becomes right. like a father son yes. proxy. Right, right, yeah. right. It never it even never gets submits to yeah. those. Yeah, which I think no. makes it so. And I mean, 
Uh, we see wa- when he shows up and there's Warrior Woman, uh, which yes. is what she's billed as. Yes. Every Absolute night. smoke so cool. show. Yep. yep. Absolute Virginia beautiful- Hayes. Her mm-hmm. beautiful eyes, beautiful wardrobe, beautiful body. Beautiful shoulder pads. Yeah. She yeah. looks fucking amazing. And you're like, oh, these two are eyeing each other. Yeah. And then it, do- it that also doesn't matter. Right. It means no. so much to yeah. me watching it. Max is weirdly asexual. And for a guy who's like sort of defined by losing his wife. I wouldn't his- say weirdly. Like sex in this world. Oh, sure. It's, you know, a lot of but sand. I'm just saying Ma- Max's <laughs> origin is he loses this is his where, uh, This is where your dry guy theory starts to butt <laughs> sure. up against exactly, some ba- yeah. you're like ah, that's no. famously those are uh, it's not a good uh, antagonistic oh, exactly. forces He's thoroughly dry <laughs> yeah I guess <laughs> sandiness can, An can be uncomfortable <laughs> I guess I I'll give you that <laughs> yeah but, but he's like he's lost his wife he's lost his child and he's lost his best friend and these movies always present to him figures who could be the replacements. Right. right. And you always get the sense that he is helping them because he doesn't want to lose someone else, but he never gets that close to them. He's There's never, never going to the let him be, right. There's never the breakthrough, re- re- yeah, yeah, and yeah. he leaves. He he'll never be hurt leaves. again, right. but he'll never feel the positive side of that again. Either. Exactly. Yeah. And he still got that weird idealistic cop thing in him, where as much as it's just like, I'm just in it to survive. I just got to survive on this fucking road. He does have this certain does, fucking yeah. compass for justice. Well, yeah, like when you see, like when he sees that uh, those people being attacked, and he goes and intervenes, and he's he's you can tell he's like, yeah. this is wrong. Right. This is I draw the line. Like he here. wants to help defenseless people constantly, and if someone is so fucking bad, he's like, oh god, I got to chase him across All the right. desert. Yeah. Ben, what do you want to say? By design right. as well, I think for a survival tactic, mm-hmm. being alone in this world is the best option. Yeah, because right. the sure. more and more right. people, the less you, down, you can hide. Or, yeah, the more yeah. you sort of have to work as a group, a collective, and then be taken advantage of right. by other groups. Yeah. So if you're yeah. a solo actor, you can sort of just operate only worrying about yourself. Just to play devil's advocate, though, the only argument for running with like a little crew is that the carpool lane is much less violent. Oh yeah, well that's why he puts a little human mask on the dog. They never show you the carpool <laughs> lane, but it's a breeze. Yeah. What if that happened in Fury Road where Charlie's like, I've got an idea. <laughs> just pulls yeah. off. Yeah, there's a Denny's. No, we can't get to her. <laughs> there's don't... a white line and two She's... double lines. She's in the express lane. <laughs> it looks like Toe Cutter doesn't have easy pass. <laughs> Take this next exit on over the get bridge. Get in here. Get Stick in here. We toll. need at least three. <laughs> yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. Um, I love uh, the looks of all the bad guys and the weapons of all the bad guys. Yeah. There's that guy who has a pneumatic, like he's one of the cop looking dudes. He has a pneumatic nail gun with a backpack attachment. But That's so much effort yeah. and look and like, but it but just adds. What else has he got to do? Right, he's gotten and that this movie gives you kind of a blanket justification in which right. what else do these people have time for? Right. They don't need to pack for survival, they need right. to pack for murder. Right. Yeah. And it's a matter of like whatever's around is a weapon. So the right. fact that there's so much crossbows but not bows and arrows yeah. makes it so funny to me. It's, it's also true. there's, there's yeah. this kind of beautiful Cuz it like it gives it that Sort of, and I, I, I always. What if the narrator was like, in the 90s, everyone went wild for crossbows <laughs> yeah. for a while. That's why they're everywhere anyway. This fact that there's no Chuck uh, ch- nunchucks in this movie is That's the only thing. That's pretty like, crazy. Yeah, yeah that is. Nuts. That is nuts. <laughs> there's not just one the dude classic, ripping right. nunchucks. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's something perversely beautiful to the idea in this movie that, like, in a world where society has collapsed and survival is the only thing, people, like, still find a way to be creative. Through their survival, yes. <laughs> through their armor, through their weapons, they're still expressing themselves. Like there is through their butt cheeks. artistry. <laughs> there is there is a poeticism too. Yes, right. everything that everyone's wearing and driving, the way they customize their vehicles, like all that sort of uh, uh, stuff. Um, here's a here's a yeah. little fun fact behind the scenes. Uh, that actor who played Wes in interviews. Uh, when after this movie came out, would Man. say that his character Vernon Wells, Vernon Wells, mm-hmm. is uh, Wes is not gay. His relationship with the Golden Boy is not a homosexual relationship. Uh, it's, it used to be in the script that he was res- I rescued him, and and he's like a father son kind of relationship. And Relax, then Wes. in the in IMDb, it, it has that quote from yeah. him that says, "Though no one has ever seen footage of this interview, and uh, George Miller <laughs> admits that that was never like he's clearly like I think people think these characters are gay, and he yeah. didn't see it while they were filming." 
filming. He's like, I'm in a thong. I cry when <laughs> yeah. this uh, when this golden boy, like uh, right. Rocky from Rocky Horror Picture Show, gets yeah. his head cut. <laughs> I cry, and I'm so angry for the rest of the movie. And I'm literally dressed like a gay dominatrix. Yeah. And then he's like, oh, shit, I better come out ahead yeah. of this. <laughs> you don't protest too much. I'm a dad. Fucking own it. Apparently he's in Commando. Yes. Oh, okay. he's the bad guy. Yeah. He, got, he puts on a lot of weight. Oh, right. He gets Jeez. fat. He's uh, ben, yeah. No, Bennett's the good guy. Uh, no, Bennett. No, he is. He's, he's Bennett. Is yeah. he the guy with the Steve weird Bennett. mesh shirt? He wears. Yeah, he's dressed. He's fat Freddie Mercury in that yeah. movie. He's got a <laughs> chainmail shirt and a fucking mustache. He looks like Donkey Lips. <laughs> he also eventually became a a Power Rangers villain. Which that, one? Uh, Rancic. Um, are there other important things to cover in this movie? I mean, it's uh, not a thing you can go through plot wise. No, really. right? Because there's no there's no point in going beat by beat because no. you're like there is no there's not even payoff to things that are set up. Yeah, uh, I, let's just talk. I like uh, the production design mm -hmm. of this movie creates worlds that you're like this looks so cool, and then when you see the functionality of the things, <laughs> yeah. it's like you're just like. You're bl I was blown away when they were like, close the gates, and the gate was a bus that you get in and drive across, and you drive it eight feet. But then when it drives across, the part of the bus that would be shown is steel plated, like over the windows and stuff. And you're like, that's just something that comes up if you live in a campsite right. like that it for like a, a number of years. You just see these things that you look at visually, and you're like, that's wild. And then you see it pay off of like how those weird drums on Max's car – you're like, that just looks cool. And then you're like, that's where the gasoline is. Yeah, you're like, right. oh, fuck. Right. Yeah, of course. Nothing I mean, is ever meaningless in a Mad exactly. Max movie. And yes. none of it's ever just cool. And Right. right. It it is it's always cool George plus George Miller, thought. you know, it yeah. back or whoever with the designers is not yeah. just true. Right. Like being like, well, yeah. What if you like, you know, had a sound system on the back of a car? Yeah. Yeah. Like what? <laughs> um, the way they defeat them is through intelligence mm -hmm. both times, mm -hmm. which does still feel like kind of, you know, they have like the two decoy kind of tricks that they yeah. do. That's like a rare, you know, it's like a scarcity in an yes. apocalyptic world, right? It's like cunning. Yes. Right, right. You know, the, the sand thing yeah. and the way they blow up the compound. I don't know. I'm just trying to think of like things we haven't forgotten. And about. that and that is also um, teamwork, yeah. which is yes. what the bad yeah, guys right, aren't right, going right. to do. Yeah. Like they're all out there for the Because they're all fucking insane gladiator types who yeah. are just like, right, like I have only, yeah. As only, my dad used to say growing up, and I, he just stole this from everyone. He's like, who wins in a race? The fox that's running for dinner or the rabbit that's running for its life? And you're like, ooh, oh, dad, ooh. interesting. What's and your, then he's like, he's just like ripping off like fucking Aesop's face yeah, or whatever. <laughs> or I was going to say no fear t-shirts, but yeah, yeah, same thing. Was your dad Tim McGraw in Tomorrowland? <laughs> no. They're two dogs. <laughs> And a gyro cap. We said plenty about the gyro captain. I, mean, he cool a, I love when he throws a snake on the guy who has a triple nail gun. Yes. And then that, or a triple crossbow, and that kills the driver because he shoots it through the back of the car. Love that he becomes the leader. It, you know, yes, they say yeah. in the end narration because it's like, this is a guy who wants yeah, to be around they, other they people. They become the great northern tribe. Yes. And he's smart. And, yes. he, and the gyrocopter guy is clearly smart. He yeah. like made the gyrocopter. He set the snake trap. He's got something. Yeah. 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 Um, love the. There's a couple of comedy bits in this movie that I think work despite it like you would never – there's the scene where uh, uh, Gyro Captain has a fucking scope to yeah. the binoculars and they have like a sort of like give me that kind of moment like <laughs> right? which yeah. you don't see in a movie like yeah. this. And then the whole – and you mentioned it earlier, but the mechanic and assistant bit when it's like, uh, how how's the bus uh, – how's the truck look? He's like, how's the truck look? He's like, oh, crack so thing. He's good. like, crack yeah. thing. Yeah. What does that mean? What does that mean? Nothing. Yeah. nothing you know, like yeah. that. that's a fucking – Simple little yes. silly like that is like more humor like and a, and a stronger choice than the shit you see in like uh, big budget PG because it's like behavioral. It's not like quippy one liner. It's not cutting the stakes of the universe. Yeah, it's not like they have motorcycles. They have motorcycles. They have motorcycles. Uh. There, there is this weird. God. There is this weird like touch of Looney Tunes in all of George Miller's stuff. Hundred percent. Not just in oh, yeah. the esca yeah. the comedy of the yes. sort of escalation and the sort of like escalation of weapons and battle and road runner while the coyote sort of ship and, and just the, the rhythms of the humor like that. that but also just that yeah everyone's like the great humor the, the, yeah. these are weird bits that people right. are yeah. doing it's a weird cartoon character that you've leaned into and invested in the do for and even right. just like the clouds of dust is so, so looney yeah. tunes yeah. like uh you're saying that really acting yep. like lit up fury road is just like road runner yeah. running like the exact even same. when he does nitrous and he's like Ooh, yeah, yeah. kind of like, <laughs> right, right. so cartoony <laughs> yeah. looney tunes yeah mm, yeah is kind of apocalyptic 
Oh, very much right, so. Right, because right. it's always weirdly in the desert. Like, because right. it's, Where are it's the, easy right. sales it's easy to animal. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I would also have loved like, the bad guy run off a cliff and then be like, look down, like just have that moment before he falls. Yeah. Look down and just see his bulge in a cod piece. And he's like, why am I wearing this? <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's like, so hot now. <laughs> why all the leather? Bugs Bunny had multiple regular antagonists who were trying to shoot him. Right, like, there right, was that yes. feeling of like, everyone's out for this fucking guy. Yeah. You've got some fucking Tex Turner, like cowboy asshole. you got some bumpkin hunter. <laughs> right. You've got some genteel rooster. I mean, he wasn't trying to shoot him. He was trying to kill him with kindness. <laughs> oh, I said, no. I said, boy. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, boy. All right, let's play the box office game, okay. guys. Come on. All right. An amazing movie. Yeah. And also, like you said, like indisputably influential. Like, right. Just, like, you and know. If you haven't, if you're listening to this podcast, one of those people who can listen to a podcast uh, talk about a movie you haven't seen yet, do yourself a favor. Oh, I think yeah. It's like, just go see this movie. You and can... it's like so simple and stripped down in the yeah. best way possible. This is the kind of movie, and it's hack to say, this is the kind of movie that makes me want to make movies. D- totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Ju- right. You just see it and you're like, fuck, this maybe is something I could do. With I want to get a chain, yeah. I want to get a bag of sand, and I want to get a camera, and let's do this thing. Okay, I'm glad you want to get a camera, because I was worried there for a <laughs> yeah. sec. You were going to be missing <laughs> one big elephant. I'm going to get a motorcycle, quit my job, <laughs> and live in the desert. <laughs> yeah, sounds like a good movie. <laughs> Dude, uh, when I saw this movie, it inspired me, and I opened a gas station. <laughs> <laughs> right. And bought a shop. Honestly, thing. that might yeah. be the most fruitful, like, like, uh, adventure, like you can take from this movie is invest in gas. <laughs> I do like the sort of fake out at the end of the the tanker getting shot, the sand coming out. You thinking that it's this like totally bleak ending of like it was all for naught. Right. Yeah, and yeah. then it was like no, they were using him as a distraction. Right, right, we got all the gas. That part is fucking cool. Yeah, everyone just had a tank in their own vehicle. <laughs> yeah, Mad Max two. The called Warrior. the Road Warrior mm-hmm. in in many countries, mm-hmm. uh, made twenty three million dollars in America. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't have worldwide numbers. Okay, it opened to two million you're not dollars Mr. worldwide. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> Apparently, made ten million Australian dollars in Australia. It opened at number four. Okay. On May twenty first, uh, nineteen eighty two, wow. in America. So you oh, know, shit. I'm three, it opened yeah. like yeah. I'm four months old. <laughs> So you, you saw it, right? Yeah, okay, yeah you were there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Number the one. amount of movies I did see in the theater that I, in hindsight, like when I do the math on it, I'm like, when did T2 come out? I was 10 and I yeah. saw that? <laughs> Jesus. Well, T2 is also that era where R-rated movies have like toys okay. and cartoon shows. Right, where you know and, like, and you're, like, you're aware yeah. of it before it comes out. You're like, right. I never saw the trailer, but I know what Terminator right. is. I haven't I seen the first one. <laughs> but they're pitching this hard to me in the pages of Nickelodeon <laughs> exactly, magazines. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right, number one uh, is a big... Um, uh, medieval or ben what a fantasy action movie with a big star. I'm sure you've done it on your podcast. Ah, uh, yes, and I believe there can be only one. There you yeah. go. Oh no, no, no! Wait, wait, wait! Oh, say, oh. Wait, no, say it. There can be only one. No, it's not that. It's, it's not, not Highlander? Highlander. No. Oh. Um. What it, other? Clue? It's not Excalibur. No, it's not. Although there's a movie coming up in this top five that is sort of an Excalibur rip. Dragon Slayer. No, I've never heard of it. You'll, we'll get to that. Okay. Number one, big yeah. star. It's, but this is an early movie for it. It's not Ladyhawk? No. B- bigger, <laughs> bigger. Bigger? Yeah. How big? The big, oh, Legend? <laughs> legend? Tom Cruise. Oh, no, 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 not Legend. No, no, no. That sorry. was a good guess, though. Good guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Bigger star. Big, fan. big bigger. star. Physically big. Oh, it, it's Conan. Yes. Uh, yeah. Which yes. one? Um, Wait, 82 the Conqueror? is the Destroyer. It's the Barbarian. Oh, Barbarian, right. the, the first, first one. Oh, the first okay. One. A Conqueror was what the third one was going to be called, right? Yes. Yeah, the it's second Destroyer one's the Destroyer. Destroyer. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Destroyer yeah. is uh, Grace Jones. Which yeah. has made $20 million in two weeks. Yeah. And it's a big hit. That was that was his, that it, was the one for him. I mean, he had Terminator already, That movie but. fucking owns. Yeah. Uh, number two. Number two. Is comedy uh, with a big comedy star of the 80s. One of his weirder movies. One of his better movies, I think. One of his better and weirder films. Yeah. Have you ever seen this one? No. And okay, he's fine. he's the guy. He doesn't have like a a, a, a partner in this no. one. Is this guy one of uh, Griffin's faves? Yeah. Uh, it's, it, so is it Gung Ho? <laughs> <laughs> is, okay. Well, so let me. Is it is it a Keaton, a Murray, or a Martin? Martin. It's oh, Martin. I was guessing Keaton's. Okay. And it's not the jerk, right? No. Jerk's 80, it's one of his I think. weirder. It's one of his weirder ones. It's yeah. one of his weirder ones. Is it 
it's not Dead believe- Men Don't Wear Plaid. It is. Yes. 1982's uh. Dead, Win- Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid. Yeah, both weird and great. Yeah, it's good, right? Yeah. I haven't seen that movie in forever. I, I think it's a Carl really Reiner good. movie. Yeah. It's his follow-up to The Jerk. Yeah. Um, with Carl Reiner. It's kind of incredible how Carl Reiner was just all in on Steve Martin. It was, he was a guy from he a bet well. different yeah, generation. Not a bad yeah. bet. Yeah. But he like made him a movie star and then stuck with him and did four more movies. Well, yeah, I think like when you're like Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro right. too, it's like- You found the guy. You're like, why would you move on from there? <laughs> right. This is a resource. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Number three is one of the most successful films of 1982. Uh, it's a comedy. It invents a genre that is big in the 80s and resurges in the late 90s. Porky's. John got it. Okay, okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry. No, no, sorry. no, 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 no. <laughs> That was impressive. I want to play. I, I like Yeah. No, it I'm good pull. <laughs> pornography. Yeah. yeah. Softcore pornography. Yes. <laughs> um, I have seen Porky's. Like, there is a plot in that it's like, we're graduating. Like, yeah. there's no fucking plot. Yeah. The, the same director who then goes on to do A Christmas Story and Baby Geniuses. I mean, it is impossible that is weird. to think that those three movies are made by the same person. Like, one is Holy so sh- gross, one is so perfect, and one is like made by someone who doesn't get a Porky's Christmas story. made $106 <laughs> million. Dollars. Humongous. Like in 82. Oh, crazy. humongous. Humongous. And you're like, what's the premise? No stars come out of it? It is no. so rare for Not a only movie. Do no star, I mean, Kim Cattrall's in it. But apart from okay. that, like, no, no one is even, kind of a star. Wait, or no, what's Booger's that? Revenge of the Nerds. Nerds. Revenge of the Nerds. Oh, sorry. Which is like, at least has like a plot and like right. so, you know yeah, like yeah, it's like yeah. sort of a vaguely oh and the characters have like some different right. you're yeah. like oh you're the gay character you're yeah. the real right. nerd you're Porky's the- has like one loser and five beefcakes yeah. and yeah. then just a bunch of like anonymous women I believe like, one of the guys names is beef in the movie or meat you're, I believe yeah. it's because either I rem- beef or meat because yes. that's like what my uh, a nickname of mine was <laughs> I just think it's like fascinating that most movies that are that big launch one major career it's, and it's I guess meat. I forgot Kim Cattrall was in it but you even look at Revenge of the Nerds and you're like, right, Anthony Edwards. Like they're like right, right. John Goodman's in this, I you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean Kim Control had been in stuff. I don't know. Yeah. It does, anyway. Crazy. Number four is the Red Warrior. Number five is a movie I've never heard of. Is this the medieval one? Yeah. And you've never heard of it. No. Crawl. No, I uh, I've please heard, I've, I've heard, heard of Crawl. I grew up in Britain. <laughs> what? It's not uh, <sighs> Is it a one it's word t- title? No, it's uh, many words. It's uh, many one, two, words. Three, four, five. Five. <laughs> five words, brother. <laughs> um, okay. It was an independent film, which is wild. That's it made kind forty of, million dollars. It was like very successful. It's like a medieval independent film with five words in the title. Yeah, it was horribly reviewed. Nonetheless, it was sort of a hit. Wow. Um, Any it's stars about, in it? No, no. It's about what? I don't know. A mercenary with a three-bladed sword rescues a princess, and there's an evil sorcerer. Like it sounds like that sounds like crawl. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's well, the three-bladed sword. You're right. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. It sounds like someone wrote a sort of junky fantasy movie. What's it called? The Sword and the Sorcerer. Wow! Wow! I cannot mm. place it. It's so generic, but it is yeah. one of those names that's like yeah. if you search it, you would get like a thousand results. It's, of course, <laughs> the yeah. guy who directed it went on to make the. Um, Captain America movie with J.D. Salinger's oh, son. Oh, Albert Pyun or whatever yes. his name is? Right. Wow. wow. So who I think was just like a low-budget guy. <laughs> yes, I think he did. I love Blank Check for that last. that poll. That, that, no, that Pyung? exact back-and-forth interaction where you're like, well, I never heard of this movie. But he did go on to make the Captain America movie with J.D. Salinger's son that thing. everyone knows what we're talking about. Oh, Albert oh, Pyun. And I know that director's name. <laughs> it's a Pyun picture? Uh, uh, so you guys are I, fucking I, I'm going to restate it, it because it was behind the Patreon paywall. But on an episode where we had my father on and we were discussing the history of New Line Pictures, David, my father, and I pretty much in unison went, well, it's just a label now. And Ben went, About. Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> yeah. You are that, the dorkiest people in the world. That's awesome. We were all rushing to say, but New Line's just a label now. My wife's first job was at New Line and was so huge for me as uh, like w- while – like. We're talking about while the fuck. This is 2004. This yeah. is like Lord of the Rings is coming. Yeah. And it was such an awesome time. She's like, we have a DVD closet. I'm like, take a picture of it. Yeah. <laughs> Show me all the DVDs. I'll tell you what to steal. My from dad's it. office was next to New Line's office. It was either he was the floor above or he was at the end of the floor. Was it like is 888? Right. This was well. Oh no. This would have been like mid nineties. Oh, okay. Okay. But the moment I remember very specifically is Austin Powers came out, and for the first time right. I cared about New Line, and they would get all this Austin Powers merch. Uh, and cool. I would like go visit my dad at the office and then go down to the bathroom, which is on the new line floor. <laughs> and then I awesome. knew which people to bug about like Austin Power shit they were getting. Some other movies in the top 10. Fighting Back, Tom Skerritt kind oh. of death wishy movie. Okay. Uh, Jared's a Fire. Yeah. 
Best Picture. Mm -hmm. Victor mm. Victoria mm. on Golden Pond. Annie opening in limited release. One of the blockbusters of the year. John Huston's Annie. Yeah. Jesus. One of the wildest blank checks of all time. So weird. Uh, the first film I ever saw. Really? Yes. Um, Whoa. My parents would... took me to like some revival of it when yeah. I was like two and a half years old. It is weird how many Oscar movies are in the top ten considering this is May. It's Memorial Day weekend essentially. Yeah. 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 It's like that used to be a thing. But what, you didn't have to release a movie in the last three months of the year. But wasn't 82 also sort of famously a good movie year, too? I feel like. Or am I just remembering that well, because it's I my Well, I feel like it's year. a good movie year, but not a great Oscar year. Um, it's a good it, movie year, E.T. Right. That's right. what movie. I'm thinking of. Blade yes. Runner, The right. Thing. Mm. Right. That's These are good movies. Wait, 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 wait a second. So, wait. Carrie to Fire, I think, is a holdover oh, oh, from last that's year's say. Oscars. And on Golden Plum must be the same thing yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's, you know. Right. Because this is the Gandhi ET year. Okay. Yeah, got oh, 82 yeah. rules. Totally. Fast Times of Richmond High. Classic. The verdict. Masterpiece. Rathacon, Road Warrior. Yeah. Tron. <laughs> Tron. 48, 80, hours. 48 hours. Yeah. Diner, huh? Tootsie, like there's a, you know, and so Gandhi, it's weird. This is, Gandhi it's weird. wins Best Picture, which is sort of like, bleh, yeah. you know. But that makes sense, yeah. at least. Yeah, this is a year that I was born, yeah. and there's no way that these movies could have any of effect on me because I was sure. born that year. But the movies you just list arguably are, are eight facets year. of my personality. Right. Yes. Yes. I just Same realized. Here. Like when you were, when I was like, when you yeah. said 48 hours, I'm like, I think we're at peak. Like, I think you yeah. make yeah. that potion and you. Turn into gay. I'm not born for years after this, and I'm at least forty percent Tron. Right? Yeah, you're. 40, I'm a lot 45. of Tron. Bullshit. I'm Tron curious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about getting the light cycle. I'm, I'm pretty Tron fluid. I will say. I love, I'm Tron um, non-conforming. Tron. Tron conforming. Yeah. <laughs> But it is I, okay. So it's the opposite phenomenon of what I thought. But an equally wild thing that in May. The films from that year's yeah, Oscars like, you know, that came out the previous year are VHS still burning up new the box office. Are still in top ten, yeah. right? Or just like it fucking runs. Like it, you know, I was talking. My dad was like talking about this as if it was still like 1982 or whatever, and he was like, "Well, what? Like Parasites made like 25 million dollars. So if it wins Best Picture, it'll get to like 50 or 60." And I was like, "If it wins Best Picture, it will have been out on iTunes for two months." <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> they, that no longer happens. Like Slumdog Millionaire was the last one where it hadn't made most of its movie by the time it won Best Picture. Most and of its then money. kind yes, of exploded. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Now they want it out on streaming by the time it wins Best Picture so yes. they can just immediately get the rentals. I saw 1917 on screener and I want so... I've never... Like... This rarely happens where I'm like, I guess I want to see it again. I on fucked the big up. Yeah. 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 I, I, yeah. I'm like, now I got to go see this again. Yeah. Because that movie my certainly is wanted... only made to be seen in a Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, it, and it was fine on DVD. I enjoyed it. Yeah. But I'm like, fuck, I would have killed to see this in like a huge screen. Totally. Yeah. And that is a movie too where you want to see it with like audience responses and stuff. It's right. so visceral that you want Ugh. you want all of that. Um, well, The Road Warrior. What a great movie. Were you going to do Merch Corner? Uh, I, I, did you look up? Yes. Okay. So I mean, I I There's realized like original yes. toys. So I realized uh, recently that Merch Corner almost never works if it's me describing a visual. Right. But there is kind of a story to this, which is he never did merchandise originally. Okay. But then in the early 2000s, so like 20 years later, a toy company started releasing action figures of the Road Warrior, and it felt like this, like, oh, the gates are open, the collector's market has kind of come up. Now finally, the Mad Max toys exist, and then they all disappeared from shelves. Sure. And it turned out that the company was kind of dodgy and they never properly got the rights for them. Right. They were just like, let's just do it. Who's going to get mad at us? Yeah. Totally. It's a 20 year old movie. It's not like the guy's got something in the works where he wants to make another one of these. <laughs> There's no fucking way. He's making happy feet. He doesn't want to do this shit. Well, little did you know. The co this was the company that had the rights to Matrix. And then that blew up and they sold a bunch of Matrix merch. And it was like, oh, they got the thing that everyone passed on that no one wanted. And then they started getting all these crazy licenses. And then it turned out they had not properly negotiated anything. Oh, so they were kind of operating on like the assumption that the deal had that closed. That sounds like a Netflix shit I'd watch or whatever. It went under like, within yeah. four years. So They're kind of a fascinating company right. and two toys. It was like people came from Kenner who worked on like Star Wars and then got really excited about like, we're going to make the action movies that never got toys for adults now and they did like Which fucking smart Steven business Seagal, model. Yeah. like Big Trouble in Little Chinatown oh, like all I would the kill to have Matrix. a fucking Jack Burton uh, action figure and all of them were like have now like disappeared go for insane prices because it was taken off the market and since then George Miller's like I'm I no merchandising a year after Fury Road came out he like relented to Funko Pops 
And Funko was very clear that they were like, we're doing this so that hopefully they'll let us make a ton of stuff. And then he was like, no, that's the end all be all. Uh, Good for him. Yeah, kind of. But also I want everything. Mm, And I just had this thought watching this movie this this morning um, of the video game Road Rash. They they did do a video game. That was highly influential to me. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I want a road rash movie. Yeah, there is just about motorcyclists that fight with chains and lead pipes. And there race. were so many video games oh. in the mid '90s that I had no time for that were like for you, marketed yeah. at yeah. you, like directly <laughs> at me or whatever. <laughs> yes. you were like, yeah. I went into a video store and someone just threw it at my head. I'm also realizing because of, uh, John, you making the comparison that if Ben had been a coked up studio executive in the early 90s, he would have been the guy who came up with Waterworld. (laughs) (laughs) I I got it. I got it. Okay, so it's Mad Max, but it's bigger and it's wetter. It's like, uh, Ben Ben wants us to do a movie about water. It's like, wasn't he the dry guy? He's like, not anymore. (laughs) His wife just left him. Susie (laughs) left him. He's been on a bender and now he's the wet guy. Yeah, he got a fucking... uh, uh, dunk pool put in his uh, <laughs> office. He's been splashing around in there. Guy's ready to rock. He's only doing jacuzzi meetings now. It's so funny how much Waterworld ripped off this. It's shit. crazy. Yeah. It's Even crazy. there's a gyrocopter yeah. in Waterworld. <laughs> and it's also it is also amazing that like so many people have ripped off pieces of what he did, and no one came close until he came back twenty years later and arguably outdid himself. Yep. And now it's like walked off the field again. And you've seen the last five years people trying to sort of do Fury Road stuff. And it's like Wait, futile. No one can Maybe he'll it. do it again? We'll, we'll talk I about it. I would fucking shit a biscuit if he, <laughs> if he comes back in 10 years and yeah. does. He doesn't do another movie for 10 years. Yeah, and, then just, and just delivers, uh, you know, Fury Road to Fury Warrior. He is, <laughs> it's been five years. It's been five Fury years. Road. And he's supposed to be starting production on a movie in 2020 starring Tilda Swinton and Idris Elba that is apparently a romance about a genie. Which one of them is the genie? That's the question. Thank I'll you. tell you, I got I, I hate to I hate to give this answer to uh, someone that I just met, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm fucking on fucking board, dude. <laughs> Holy shit. And that's the thing, George Miller has whatever the Gabrus blank check version is yeah. like, I'll see whatever that guy puts out. Right. Safety brothers. There's few people that you I'll just see. You pre-bought your tickets. I'll, I pre- yes. Right. Right. I, yeah. I'll you help you build like, a boat. You've GoFunded me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, George Miller, you can, if I'll you're listening you to this, I yeah. promise you, I promise you, you have at least one ticket sale of whatever you make for the rest of your life. Uh, and I see shit in theaters. Yes. Um, thank you so much for being on the show. Dude, Other than your many podcasts, which yes. you should promote now. Oh, now's the time. Yeah. So uh, I have a podcast called High and Mighty that oh, uh, yeah. Griffin's been on a few times. Uh, Tonight, at the time we're recording, I am going going to be going with you to do a power hour yes. on stage drinking a shot of white claw every minute if you're a movie head i have a movie podcast that's on patreon called action boys oh, yeah. where three dudes review action movies uh, often longer than the runtime of the movies themselves i mean and if you like blank check you like the sound of that <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. yeah and we have uh you know, we have a ton of episodes now, so if you want to jump on for one month and listen to, like, 100 episodes and then cancel your shit, yeah. go for it. Hide them in months. a tanker yeah. truck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Don't give them ideas. No, no, no. Uh, monthly, guys. Yeah. Take Just your plug time. the credit card yeah. info in and forget about yeah. it. Set it and forget it. I, I want to make money off you like 24-hour <laughs> fitness has been for 10 years. Uh, <laughs> and you got the Gino Lombardo show on and Stitcher. I, and I got the Gino Lombardo show on Stitcher Premium. And uh, Gino which, Lombardo, my favorite character in comedy. <laughs> thank you. He's yes. my – He's uh, and I appreciate you calling him a character. <laughs> <laughs> That's my uh, character who's pretty much just a more unfiltered version of myself doing a shitty accent. But I did 10 episodes of a drive time radio show fully uh, improvised, but with tons of bits. I, I do like eight fake commercials per episode. <laughs> so it's like the most amount of work I've put into a podcast ever, ever. possibly anything ever, but definitely. Uh, and one last thing to plug. If you're ever on YouTube, search Strong Island and see it's still up. Hey, really? I found it the other day. The web series. <laughs> I sent the screenshot to Justin of me Justin and you and Justin Tyler him. and John Gabriel's <laughs> web series in which Riley Solner and I appear in an episode. Oh, yeah, yeah, where Griffin plays a child to our adults. Yes. <laughs> and we are four years and age Can I ask you one final question? Sure. If, and it's unlikely, but by the time this episode comes out, we will know. It will have happened. If Bombshell wins Best Cast at the SAG Awards, will you tell people, like, I was part of the SAG That's the cast? That's the thing. I don't know how far down they go. Here, here's my bigger thing. Yeah. If Charlize, uh, did she get nominated for- She did. She did. 
You, I, you might be the clip. I might be in her Oscar. Gabriel's might be the clip. Yeah, you're right. You're right. There's a good chance. Like that's the biggest yeah. bet I have is that I end up. Uh, uh, you see my face at the Oscars. Yeah, and, and somehow I'm not. I, if they get the SAG award, which I think it seems like it might be in the bag because it's like just names alone. A lot of people. Yeah, yeah they got yeah. the quantity going. Somewhere. Yeah, if they can yeah. get because if you're the SAG awards, you want that table. Oh, right. <laughs> like, you want a shot of that fucking table. Right. 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 <laughs> um, yeah, I would love to. I would love to be invited. So to you, that. you might be a theoretical. You probably won't get a trophy, but you can tell people that you won a SAG. Award. Oh yeah. Well, the funny thing is, like, uh, uh, my friend, our friend Darcy, is in the movie yeah. too, and she has like two more scenes than me. Yeah. But she's more famous, has more, and so we went. I went to the cast and crew screening, yeah. and I was like, "Oh, are you going to this?" She's like, "Yeah, I'll see you there." And then, like, a couple of days later, she was on the red carpet for right. the premiere. I'm like, "I wasn't invited to." Oh, that's that. what. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. like real life, always at the bachelor party, never in the bridal party. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, um, and David, next time I'm in New York doing uh, High and Mighty, or next time you're in LA, ever I want you to do come do High and Mighty. Let's talk about I'm it. Very, I would love. We to both do High grew and up Mighty. in America, so we have a lot of stuff in common. I lived talk. here for nine full years before I moved to Britain. <laughs> what? 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 No. Wait, wait. Should the bit now be that I'm like, but I also lived in America? It is funny because you know the premise of High and Mighty is find a common ground, something <laughs> right, that right, you right, love right. with Gabriel. So Griffin's been on four times talking about Fast and Furious. I'm aware. I'm aware. Yeah. And and by the way. During the power hour tonight, I'm mostly going to talk about Fast and Furious. <laughs> We're going to have a hard time not doing it. <laughs> it would be quite a move, though, if you picked your subject for a High and Mighty episode to be America. <laughs> Shut up, I love America. <laughs> Greatest country on earth. I don't know about you, but from zero to nine, I love this place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love America from 86 to 95. Those were the good years. The good years. Uh, well, thank you all for listening. Yeah. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe. Go to patreon.com backslash blank check. For blank check special features. Yeah. Where at this point in time, we're probably we're dropping some toy stories, we're finishing up Star Wars, something like that. Ben is whispering something very secret to David. It's not gonna be referenced on air. <laughs> ben has to go. <laughs> Jesus, end that fucking come on. Okay, Ben wants me to end the fucking episode. <laughs> yes. Go to blankies.com for some real nerdy shit. Thanks to Joe Bone and Pat Rounds for our artwork, Lane Montgomery for our theme song. Andrew Agudo for our social media. Producer Rachel for editing. He's packing up the laptop. And as always, Ben does not like me narrating what he's doing right now, but he is zipping up his bag with a lot of animosity. (laughs) It's very weird how uncomfortable he is with it. I have to go to therapy. I'm late already. Congratulations, humble brag. That's the name of my clothing brands. (laughs) 